गुलाब सा हेलो हेलो गुलाब सा गुलाब सा को फोन कर दो हेलो गुलाब सा हेलो गुलाब सा गुलाब सा को फोन कर हेलो हेलो गुलाब सा एंकर हेलो गुलाब सर यस गुलाब सर यू प्लीज स्टार्ट यस सर हेलो सर एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस इज ऑडिबल यू प्लीज कीप योर वीडियो ऑन प्लीज यस सर Sir, shall I start? Please start. So, a warm good good morning to all of you present here, respected Dean School of Physical Sciences, Assam University, Sir Professor Chiranjan Bhatta Charji. respected head of the department of physics as well as the convener of this program professor b indrajit sharma chairperson of the program professor otri deshmukh respected invited speakers faculties and attendees of the conference on behalf of the organizing committee i gulabsh choudhury welcome you all to the international webinar on nanomaterials and nano science it gives me immense pleasure to offer our sincere gratitude to all present here i hope everyone had a great diwali Despite the COVID pandemic, we could have celebrated the festival of light on high spirit with the hope that everything will be back to normal very soon. Meanwhile, in line with the new normal, Department of Physics Assam University Silchar is celebrating its Silver Jubilee this year. To mark this, we are having a series of invited talk, motivational interaction, and conferences since last few months. The international webinar on nanomaterials and nanoscience conference is also held in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of this department. We shall have one technical session today and another on tomorrow. There will be three invited talks today followed by two on tomorrow. I request all of you to kindly turn off your camera and mic during the session. Now without further ado, I request the convener of this conference, Professor B. Indrajit Sharma, head of the Department of Physics, to address the meeting. Sir, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, at the very beginning, I welcome all my uh, speakers, Dr. Lyson Thomas Singha, Hong University of Science and Technology, South Korea. Dr. Sir Arshan Hussain, Tripura University, India; Professor Sangam Chatterjee, Germany; and Dr. K. Jigeshwar, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. At the very beginning, at the very beginning, I was afraid to organize this seminar, Nano Science and Nano Materials, as I do not have much known people to approach as speakers. One day, Professor Atri called me. In the result, you do it. Everything will be fine. Without beginning, how do you conclude? You are afraid. On that day itself, I discussed with my friend Professor Arshad Fussel. He is one of the speaker here. He helps me to get the speakers in this seminar. Around 183 participants had registered. Now, to this day, we are starting this seminar. I take this opportunity to thank Honorable Vice Chancellor for allowing us 
to organize this webinar. I also thank then Professor Chair Bhattacharjee, Chairperson Professor Atridesa Mukhya, all my colleagues in the department for their support and cooperation. I am very much thankful to all the research scholars in the department for their help and support. Whenever I need their support is always there. I hope this seminar will give benefit the, par the participants. We will learn the basic and the frontier research area of nanoscience and nanomaterials. Thank you. Over to Golapsa. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request the chairperson of this conference, Professor Othri Dashamukko, to address the meeting. Ma'am. Hello. Uh, thank you, Gulasa. A uh, very good morning. A very good morning to you all, whoever is participating in the program, respected speakers, and whoever dignitaries is present in the inaugural program. Uh, actually, as already explained by the convener, neuroscience and nanotechnology is a new buzzword in the world of physics as well as chemistry. So subject wise, it's a flourishing area and we tried to organize many events this year as we are celebrating the uh, 25th year of the Department of Physics, Asham University, Silchar. Uh, we are trying to give uh, the MSc students and the first few years uh, PhD students also a uh, glimpse about the newly developing or the established areas of physics where forefront research work is going on. So we are organizing a series of uh, webinars uh, at least once every month from starting from the month of July. Now it is November and uh, we are celebrating 25th year of the department, which has uh, started back in uh, 1996. Uh, in that occasion, I welcome you all as a chair of the local organizing committee of this event. And I hope you will enjoy the event and uh, we are looking forward for two days academic introduction, fruitful academic introduction, and I hope some people will be inspired to take up research in this area. Uh, with this much, uh, I wish to end here. Uh, we are looking forward towards the technical sessions, which are more important and interesting to all of us. Thank you, Gulapsa. Over to Gulapsa. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to request our respected Dean School of Physical Sciences, Professor Chiraranjan Bhattacharjee, to say a few words. Sir, please. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I believe uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dilip Chandranath, who is the uh, patron of this webinar, uh, could not be present. Uh, and um, the webinar chairperson, Professor Atri Deshmukho, convener, B. Indrajit Sharma, faculties, scholars, students, and dear participants, and the distinguished speakers for these webinar. Dr. L. Kamar Singh, from South Korea, Professor Shandam Chattajinguru, and uh, Dr. Shahid Arshan Hussain of Tripura University, and Professor Jibon Jyoti Dash of Cotton University, Guwahati. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual meet at our university, being organized by the Department of Physics on a topic of very thematic importance. Materials at nanoscale has captured the attention of researchers since last couple of decades. As an emerging area of science, nanoscience and the corresponding technology today is considered as an extremely important area with immense possibilities of newer applications. From energy solutions, communications to healthcare, it has ushered a new era. Besides technology, even the science involved is quite new, which is just beginning to unfold. Despite tremendous prospects and potential for future development in nanoscience and nanotechnologies, there also lie 
challenges in relation to health, safety, environment, social and ethical implications, which also needs to be addressed through more and more research. Physics has been taking lead in organizing several such webinars and taking painstaking efforts to get experts on different areas with specific themes to discuss and share new knowledge. Thus, I believe it serves as a trigger for our young scholars and researchers to recognize new art friends and take up challenging tasks of research. I congratulate the department, students, scholars, and faculty for such a cohesive effort. Touching a Silver Jubilee uh, milestone is a moment of glory for any de department or institute. And the celebration that has begun 25 years back should go on undeterred. So I also congratulate once again for stepping into the 25th year of the celebration to all the members of the department. I sincerely believe that this webinar with esteemed speakers deliberating and sharing their expertise will effectively stimulate the young researchers creating a base for multidisciplinary research pursuits. Best wishes to the participants. Hope you have a meaningful interactions through these two day proceedings of the webinar. I wish the webinar a great success. All the best to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, with this, we have come to the end of this inaugural session. I would like to request Dr. Mohanando Boro to propose a vote of thanks. Sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Gulab, sir. So am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir, you're okay. audible. Thank you. Uh, a very good morning to all present here. I, uh, Dr. Mahananda Boru, on behalf of the physics department, Assam University, Silchar, feel honored to present the vote of thanks uh, at this inaugural program of International Webinar on Nanoscience and Nanomaterials, 16-17 November 2020. First, I would like to propose a hearty vote of thanks to our chief patron, Professor Dilip Chandra Nath, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Assam University, for making this event happen. I'd like to express my profound gratitude to our Honorable Dean, Albert Einstein School of Physical Sciences, Professor C. R. Bhattasarji, for his interesting and thought-provoking inaugural address. I would like to thank uh, Chairperson of this event, Professor Atri Deshmukhya, for her nice word. I would like to express my profound gratitude to the invited speakers of this event, Dr. Leshram Tumba Singh, Dr. Shayet Arsat Hussain, Professor Sangam Saturji, Dr. K. Jugeshwar Singh, Professor Jibwan Jyoti Das. I am happy to express my vote of thanks to the members of the organizing committee, Professor B. Indrajit Sharma, convener and head of the Department of Physics, faculty members and research scholars of the physics department. I'm also thankful to the university authority for their constant support and cooperation in conducting this webinar. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants for attending this inaugural program. Once again, I thank one and all present here. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, with due permission from the chair, I would like to conclude the session here and proceed for the technical session. Ma'am, may I? Yes, please, Dr. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, before going to start our technical session, I would like to mention that during the session, if anybody wishes to put forward any queries, they may do so in the chat box provided in the meeting platform, which shall be answered at the end of each lecture. And all the sessions presented will be recorded and will be available very soon after the conference concludes. 
so now we are going to start our first technical session the first lecture will be delivered by dr leshram thombas singh uh, pohang university of science and technology south korea the topic of discussion will be modification of electronic properties of epitaxial graphene synthesized in ultra high vacuum chambers using metal intercalation technique before handing over the session to our invited speaker i would like to give a brief in introduction about our speaker sir dr leshram thomas singh is associated with beamline research division pohag accelerator laboratory pohag university of science and technology south korea his ma major research areas are nano science and nano technology thin film surface science he work on a variety of materials including carbon nanotubes graphene transition metal uh, calcogenides dirac materials and well semi metals he got his phd degree from indian institute of science bangalore isc he was he was a post doctoral research fellow at iisc bangalore post at south korea also national institute of science and technology south korea and pal south korea he has working experience in world class synchrotron facility at pal He has published many research papers at high impact peer reviewed international journals including Physical Review Letters SES Nano Physical Review X etc He got best poster award set ICANN 2009 held at IIT Guwahati the 6th SRC summer workshop 2014 held at I uh, sorry held at uh, POS Postec South Korea and Young Scientist Award at Pune 2010 held at Manipur University Imphal So sir uh, I would like to hand over the platform to you Thank you can you hear me Yes sir we can hear you Okay I want to see the screen You want to share? okay sir are you able to do that Yes a minute I am trying now Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go from present now. That's a minute. Yeah, it's coming. Hmm. Sir, you just shared that window you want to present. Yeah. Yeah. Only one window you present. Uh, you can stop presenting. go back and present only your uh, screen that you want to share i want to share my screen but uh... you want to share the full screen or you want to share a particular window where your uh, presentation is yes i want to share the full screen of my presentation then you can see your properly phone. computer is screen is coming i can see the whole computer screen of yours oh then very good okay mm. okay now it has come yeah okay. yeah then make it full screen kindly okay can you see the full screen properly yeah, yeah. Fine, okay is then uh, okay thank you thank you all first i will i will congratulate to the department for this anniversary and uh, i would like to thank all of this organizing committee especially uh, professor indrajit for inviting me okay coming to my talk i don't want to repeat the title again as i already announced but what i want to do is that we synthesis epitaxial graphene and we want to modify this property with metal intercalation technique and we use ultra high vacuum chambers for this synthesis in this picture I want to show the lab where we work. This is a part of a synchrotron facility, and uh, if you see my cursor, then this points the angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy unit, and uh, this one represents the ultra high resolution photo emission spectroscopy, so we call ISRPS, and our base is the this one. there are many accessory parts i will not go to the detail of this the beam is coming from uh, here along this direction and uh, i will explain in a better way in the coming slides 
This is the content of my talk. First, I like to give a brief account of the intrinsic property of graphing from where it arises and what really experimentally we face. Can we get experimentally this interesting property every time? Uh, if it is not so, then is there any solution? Then I will, would like to briefly discuss what is synchrotron facility to the uh, young minds. Then I want to present how we synthesize graphene typically on a nickel-1-1 surface. This synthesis graphene can be modified using a technique called intercalation. And we have a theoretical support from the density function theory, and we want to compare with our experimental data here. The target of this work is we want to get a quasi free standing graphene, that means freely floating graphene, without interaction with the substrate where it stains. We use a different material, uh, magnesium, for intercalation again, but the target is different. Here, we would like to introduce superconductivity, induce superconductivity in the graphene. And if time permits, then we we'll to uh, discuss the synthesis of graphene in some other substrates and the possible uh, intercalation mechanism. At the end of the talk, I would like to conclude it, and I would like to have a short discussion for the future works. We know graphene. This is a one hexagonal layer of and the carbon atoms. It is just one layer of graphite. It is just peeled out. We can peel it out mechanically. This is called mechanically exposed graphene, and we can put an ice BN surface. Ice BN surface, hexagonal bronated surface, is very flat. So in this system, we can get the interesting property of graphene. So from where this interesting property of the graphene arises? If we look to the graphene structure, we see six carbon atoms in the hexagon. Out of this, we can make uh, two triangles. Triangular subdivisions are there. So if we rotate 120 degree, we can get another uh, triangular subdivision. They are equivalent. If we look the bane structure, uh, the, that is uh, brillant zone of the uh, at the brillant zone of the graphene. This brillant zone is also uh, hexagonal, similar to the structure. I want to mention the positions, high symmetry points in the brillant zone. Corners are called K points, and the center of the uh, this uh, brillant zone is called gamma point, and uh, middle of this side is called M point. We are going to study band structure at these high symmetry points. If we look closely at this K point, we see that the conduction band and the balance band are meet at the, the Fermi level, and the bands are linear. So this is the main source of intrinsic property of graphene. Yes, the bands are linear. They follow the relativistic Dirac equation. So they are called uh, Dirac electrons point, contact points called Dirac electron, band is called Dirac band. This is not similar with the usual uh, materials which have the parabolic band. They follow the Schrodinger equation. Here it follows the Dirac equation. And uh, there are two types of uh, these corner K points. One is called K and K prime. They are different from the point of the chirality. Now the question is, every time can we access this intrinsic property? That is not. We, there is a report that we can see this intrinsic property on such type of prepared mechanically exploited graphene. This is uh, good, but the problem is that the size. Generally, here the graphene can uh, be at the maximum some micrometer to one to three micrometers. But if we want a large area and keeping the, this high quality graphene, then what we can do for the large area growth, we can use a CBD chemical vapor deposition growth or metal foils or metal films, metals like copper, nickel, iron, etc. But what is the problem here? These metals are the graphene are of low quality, and that there are many domains of different crystallographic orientations and the grand boundaries and defects are there. For example, if we pick if we pick up the graphene on copper substrate, there are lots of domain orientations because of the weak interaction between the copper substrate and the graphene. Now, 
the story is not in here, we have to transfer it to the other substrate. In this transferring process, we have to dissolve the copper substrate or copper foil, then transfer it in the another substrate. In this transferring process, uh, many tearing and uh, many defects are introduced. So in every step, there is a problem and the intrinsic property of the graphene is much affected. Then, is there any solution for this? We have used one technique. That technique is we are going to see here in this work. To know better, let's look at the graphite. This is the mother of the graphene. We know there are many layers of uh, graphene in the graphite. If we vaporize nearby uh, some metals nearby to this, then the carbon atoms stick between the layers, uh, between the monolayers, maybe between the bilayers. So this process of introducing layer of metals between the graphene layers is called intercalation. That technique is we are going to use here. What is the importance of this technique? Generally, we know intrinsic graphene and the intrinsic graphite doesn't have superconductivity. Such intercalated graphite is generally called graphite intercalated compounds, GICs. They are very important from the point that they possess the property of superconductivity. Now the question is, can we induce superconductivity in graphene? So this is one of the target in my talk. And then can we do the metal intercalation in the only one monolayer graphene or metal substrate? In this picture, we saw uh, the intercalated metal layer, the pink balls, and below the graphene layer, black balls, and uh, above the substrate, that, uh, that gray balls. So this is the picture representation, but there are many problems. We have to search the appropriate metals and the different intercalation tech conditions. And one of the report is that it opens a band gap. If it opens a band gap, then intrinsic property will be affected so in searching the answer of these questions we have used a, one uh, this synchrotron facility there are a few synchrotron facility in the world this is one of the world-class synchrotron facility in south korea this is called pohang accelerator laboratory in the introduction phase i saw a part of this beam line of this so in briefly let me explain what is synchrotron facility in the left side, there is a straight portion. This is called linear, linear accelerator. Here, ele electrons are accelerated with high kinetic energy. They are introduced in this circular ring called storage ring. The beam is going to store here. How we are going to store it? The steadily moving electrons will be bent using the bending magnet or undulators. Then when this high moving, Electrons are bent with a flying magnetic field, then they produce ejected X rays and photons. These X rays and photons are available for the use of uh, Ackerman. So, at different sections, we can get the different beam lines. In our beam lines, we have the facility of ultra high vacuum, so we call UV, uh, USB, STM, scanning, tunneling, microscopy, and the R phase, angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. Uh, uh, there are many accessory units like a low energy electron diffraction system and uh, for the core level study, ICRPES, so hydrogen photoemission spectroscopy is very appropriate. To be specific, the instruments here we use a uh, 5 volts, uh, 5 volts 150 electron analyzer. They are hemispherical electron analyzers. Uh, they are, uh, I think you have seen in the XPS system also. That's very similar. Here we use uh, um, Santa R4000. They are very good uh, um, electron analyzers. We have the good resolution around uh, 50 milli electron volt at uh, 34 electron volt photon energy. We synthesize our samples in situ in ultra high vacuum because in such systems, uh, the cleanness and the vacuum condition is very important. For the, for the layered materials, just we can peel it off and introduce uh, in the vacuum chambers, uh, that means we fill it in the ultra high vacuum chamber and without breaking the vacuum, we introduce in the experimental section. For the surface science, 
it is effective only top layer, uh, the few atomic layers on the top of the surface. That's why this is very surface sensitive. We have to have a very clean surface. So the environment on this actual man, I mean inside the chamber, should be ultra high vacuum condition. We use the photon source uh, from the synchrotron, or if there is no synchrotron facility, then we use lab source and vacuum ultraviolet uh, lab source. Here, I like to discuss how we synthesis graphene on metal substrates, uh, typically on nickel one 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 uh, single crystal surface. As I mentioned, we need very high clean surface. So we can do in two ways, the repeated cycle of the sputtering and the ending. What is the sputtering? It is just argon and bombardment on the cycle, uh, on this surface, just bombard it. And then it hit it by hitting with electron beam. We use a electro, uh, filament, then the electrons are ejected and they stack on the surface, then they become the uh, surface very clean. The Surface cleanliness can be confirmed using STM or XPS or uh, lit low energy electron diffraction. So here I saw the clean surface using STM topography. This is a high area, uh, terrace area. Then if we look closely, the atomic resolution we see here, this representative uh, atomic resolution surface image from the STM. After confirming the cleanliness, we synthesize graphene on this. This is the typical condition. We use acetylene as a carbon source. Uh, the pressure condition is 1.0 to 5 into 10 power minus 6 millibar, and the emission range is I to 14. What this emission current is doing, and from the filament, the electrons emitted and they stack on the surface that heat up the uh, surface. So we can get an heat up around 700 to uh, near 1,000 degrees Celsius on the surface, and then just five minutes experimental condition, uh, duration is enough to synthesis monolayer graphene. On this, we used the STM, and we found in the formation of the graphene. Here we see signals, atomic signals from three atoms out of the six carbon atoms to the graphene hexagon. Why three are missing? This is because of strong interaction between the graphene and the sub nickel substrate is because they have a very similar, very close lattice constants. You know, in the graphene, it is 2.46 Armstrong, and for nickel, it is uh, 2.45. So, lattice mismatch is 1.12%, very close. That's why they have a strong interaction. Not only that, for the interaction, the closeness, how much the distance between the two layers is also very important. So, if we reduce the layer distance, then we increase the layer distance by introducing some atomic layer, then it can leap up from the surface. So if we introduce a sodium layer, intercalated sodium layer lattice between the graphene and the substrate, then we can recover the six volt symmetry of the graphene. Here you see uh, six volt symmetry of the graphene is visible in the STM topography. Yes, we see the surface and we see uh, the six volt symmetry, but can really the electronic property, pristine property of the graphene is available or not, can be, is recovered or not, can be confirmed from the Benny structure. To know better the experimental results and our experiment, let's first uh, uh, present the DFT results, density function theory results. This is implied sexual model. I rep we represent here. Uh, in this model, the white balls are nickel surface, nickel atoms. Then uh, the pink balls represents the graphene. So we here in this top view, we see the graphene hexagons above the white ball of the nickel substrate. Here, the carbon atoms of the graphene hexagon want to sit at top position and the FCC sides of the substrate. Now, ICP side is remaining back and unoccupied. This just fall at the center of the graphene hexagon. So if we introduce uh, uh, metal atoms, they like to sit here. So they started sitting here in the log coverage. If we start introducing them. The unit cell is on by this uh, white dust box uh, lined. We want to express how much sodium is covered in terms of monolayer. You need one, one monolayer is one sodium atom per five carbon atoms. So we do, 
we introduce more, the density is increases, and uh, uh, that size of the sodium crystal unicell is reduced. Now we know that interaction depends on the distance. So to have a better idea about the interaction, let's see the what is the distance between the graphene and integrated atom and uh, uh, integrated sodium atom and the substrate that distance. There is also high chance that the sodium atom may sit above the graphene instead of the integrated below it. So let's discuss uh, the, that distance also from the DFT calculations. In the Friesen system, that the graphene on nickel system, as I like to say, uh, Friesen system, here the distance between the graphene and the nickel is around 2.0 white and strong. If sodium layer is floating above the graphene, then with the increase of the coverage, we see uh, there is increase of the distance between sodium and the graphene. Why the distance is increasing with the uh, coverage is increasing? The so sodium crystals are covering above the graphene. If we more introduce uh, the sodium atom, the crystal become better. That's why interaction between the graphene and uh, this uh, floating uh, sodium absorb sodium layer crystal interaction decreases. That's why distance is increases. And the graphene nickel distance is not uh, changing much. Now coming to the important case that is the uh, integrated graphene. Here with the uh, increase of the coverage, there is no change in the sodium graphene uh, layer this, uh, distance and the graphene nickel. Then overall, what is the important point for, from here? I'd like to point out that the uh, important point as I mentioned, the distance between the graphene and the nickel friction system is two. But after intercalated, the distance of the graphene and the nickel is increased more than double times here, this is 4.8. So the interaction is much reduced. Definitely there will be strong competition between the uh, absorption and the integration of who will win in this competition. That can be easily understood from the energy uh, analysis versus the sodium coverage. This blue line represents the absorption, and uh, this uh, red line represents the absorption intercalation. So, from energy point of view, the energy is very favorable in the case of the intercalation. So, if there is competition between this absorption and intercalation, definitely integration will take place. So, we can ignore the absorption case. As we are show that there is possibility of intercalation, then definitely we can see the Dirac point. And uh, in this curve, we want to see the moving of the Dirac point with respect to the Fermi level. We see here in the low coverage, the Dirac point is visible. Then with the increase of the co sodium coverage, it goes down uh, very quickly. Then around 6.3 uh, Dirac point remains stable. It, so we don't need uh, more addition of the sodium. With this point, that is uh, this coverage 0 0.6 monolayer, is taken as a reference and uh, for the calculation and uh, for the experiment, we will try to um, keep this 0 0.6 monolayer coverage. This is the main important result from the DFT calculation. Here, here it shows the majority has been the Benny sector at the reference point 0 0.63 monolayer coverage. Uh, as we have shown the system model, the graphene on nickel and the sodium over, above the graphene layer and the uh, sodium is below the graphene. What is the change in the Benny sector? Here we see the straight lines. These straight lines are the pristine graphene Benny sector. Uh, the straight lines and uh, they meet at the uh, premier level. Uh, and these green balls are coming from the bends of the nickel, and the red ones are coming from the graphene. So we don't see proper uh, Dirac band, and even there is a band gap. If we absorb so the sodium above it, uh, above the graphene, uh, the only addition is the surface state of the sodium here uh, by the pink or blue balls. But drastic change we see in the case of the intercalation here, uh, we see the preferred Dirac cone 
proper drug ban in the case of the interglassin. Okay, we can see from the uh, uh, DFT theory, but experimentally can we really observe uh, is available this uh, drug corn. This is a signal of free stain graphene. Really it is uh, experimentally available or not. So we have to see the Bain structure with using our face and glazophotoemission spectroscopy. We have taken the Bain structure at two positions of the graphene balance zone, the center called gamma point and the corner called K point. These two images are taken at the K gamma point, the center of the balance zone, and these two are taken at the gamma point, uh, sorry, K point. These gamma point images, let me explain what are these bands. These top layer bands, just below the primary level, are coming from nickel 3D band. And uh, this one is from the inclined one is coming from the sigma band. And uh, this uh, parabolic step, this one is coming from the uh, pi state. So there is no difference between two images uh, before interclassing and after interclassing, band is actually gamma point. Now, an interesting point is the band is the, taken at the K point. First one, C is coming from the, before interclassing, we don't see proper Dirac on, the, but pi states are available here around uh, 2.7 uh, below the Fermi level. But here, after interclassing, we observe a nice Dirac on just below the Fermi level. If we look closely, then in the figure E here, we observed that the upper cone and the lower cone are touching at a point, almost no band gap is here, only linearity is little modified. That means we can recover the pristine property of the graphene just by intercalating one uh, layer of sodium. So the graphene is behaving like the quasi free standing just uh, floating, even though it is uh, sitting above a substrate. This is the uh, target of this work. Now, <coughs> let's discuss about the king just below the family. But if we draw the momentum dispersion curve, then this is the curve uh, the, of different intensities at different wavelength, uh, wave vector versus energy. Following the wave vector at the Dirac point, we see uh, no appreciable band gap represented by this the blue line. But just below the primary level, around 200 milli electron below the primary level, uh, there is king. There are many reports about this king. They explain that this is due to the electron phonon and electron plasma interaction. From that, uh, the band is actually easily normalized and uh, this uh, king uh, comes out. Now the question is, uh, what are the interclassing temperature? At what temperature interclassing is taking place? To analyze this, firstly, we confirm the graphene uh, formation, then we lower down temperature at 140 degrees C, minus 140 degrees C. Here, band structure is preserved. If we introduce the sodium, no band structure is changed. It means that polymer introduced so they match it above or as they absorb case. Now we rise the temperature to minus 100 degrees C. We uh, observe proper Dirac cone here. If we warm it at 20 degrees Celsius, uh, Dirac cone is still uh, precious. So for intercalation, minus 100 degrees Celsius is enough for in the case of the sodium. And whatever intercalation taking place at the room temperature is a spontaneous case. Now coming to the core level uh, PES, we cannot ignore the core level and uh, the emission spectroscopy. We can uh, get some <coughs> information from this, but I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, much detail. What I'd like to mention is that uh, this is carbon 1S peaks in three cases, graphene only care, uh, the black one, and uh, this uh, green one is the graphene, uh, the intercalated case, and the red one is the absorbed case. Definitely, and the uh, before integration should be uh, intensity should be uh, better. And here is a nickel peak, uh, sodium peak, and a nickel peak area. If we focus here, we see that uh, there are different peak intensities. Definitely, this black demonstration case there should not be sodium peak as confirmed. And uh, we see uh, the 
this absorbed case intensity is bigger, higher, because it is floating above the surface, so intensity should be more. So we can integrate, uh, we can uh, correlate experimental condition and the XPS. Now coming to the different, we, in the previous we have discussed for the sodium integration, now we change the metal to magnesium. So we can get a different kind of property from graphene. We expect different kind of property. But the system is very similar, so we will not, uh, I don't like to uh, repeat the, most of the results here. What the different uh, bandages we observe is given here. These bands are taken at the K point where we can see the Dirac cone. This, uh, uh, this is a pristine one, so no proper Dirac cone. But in the low coverage, Dirac cone appeared. Uh, it will increase the coverage. We observe two Dirac cones. From where this is arising, this is coming from interaction with the absorb and the another one is graphene interlayer. So from this interaction, we got two Dirac cones here. If we heat it, then uh, most of the absorbed sodium goes below the graphene as interrelated state and uh, crystal quality improves. That's why we got a proper Dirac cone here. So the different locations of the mechanism can be located using STM surface topography. This bottom images are STM topography at different coverage. The first one is before uh, sodium absorption or interclassion. The corner image, inside image, is FFT image, fast Fourier transform image of, of this system, of this image. Here we see the spots indicated by the green arrows. This corresponds to the carbon atoms, the graphene. The initial is uh, drawn here. In the log covers, we spotted new spots shown by the small uh, blue arrows. The initial is shown here. So this uh, belong to the intercalated case. But if we introduce more than they are both uh, Integrated and absorbed case. That's why uh, the spot of the absorbed case is visible. This is indicated by the, uh, this small white arrows in the FFT image. And the initial is drawn here in the, as a white box in this uh, graphene topography image. So we can confirm uh, that there are two types of the magnesium location above the graphene and below the graphene. This is the main sort of result for this uh, uh, experiment. But before coming to the main result in the zone on the left side, let me share uh, some literature survey. As I mentioned in the beginning slides, that graphite and the graphene doesn't have a superconductivity property. But graphite can be induced superconductivity by intercalating metal, for example, calcium intercalated case. Uh, Superconductivity so temperature is uh, 11.5. So below this, uh, it possesses superconductivity property. Now the question is, in the single layer, monolayer can be induced. It is theoretically predicted, and it can have transition temperature around 1.8.1 K. And uh, there is experimental report for this observation of superconductivity with the uh, uh, transition temperature 5.9. So they explain that this is due to the phonon induced superconductivity. This is coming from the, not the graphene graphene interaction, this is coming from the introduction of the another layer. But recently in 2018, uh, one group from MIT, they reported that if we twisted two graphene layers, twisted like the bilayer system, at the small uh, angle rotation, there is uh, superconducting uh, electronic property is observed in the transport measurement. From here, this is coming. If we study the band structure, a third band is visible at the K point. Generally, at the K point, we see the Dirac cone, cross co bands, but there we observe the flat band here. And the temperature they found is a very, transient temperature is very, very small, 1.9. If, if we increase the rotation, uh, then the transient temperature is become lower, and uh, they observe this phenomenon at specific temperature, uh, specific rotations called uh, magnetic angles. 
Let's say lowest one, 1 1.1, have the highest transient temperature, 1 point K. How this is occurred? This is because when we rotate to periodic systems, more patterns are observed. These more patterns produce their own potential, more potential. These more potentials act to the graphene system. So they modify the electronic property. That's why we observe the flat band. The flat band is a signature. Now, what I'd like to mention is that more pattern is very important because it can produce more potential and it can add to the graphene band structure or graphene electronic property can be modified. So I'll come to the more pattern in the coming slides. Here I'd like to mention is that as we the signature of superconductivity in the band structure is the flight and the flat band. In the case of the GICs, in the band structure, the parabolic band at the gamma point of the of the graphene balance zone, or the interband layers are visible in the band structure. They are the signature of, of the superconductivity. So we're coming to our result. In this system, magnesium graphene, magnesium system, absorb graphene uh, intercalated nickel system. We absorb parabolic band that below the Fermi level at the gamma point. This should be the signature of the graphene, uh, so, uh, sorry, signature of superconductivity in graphene. So we can say that we found there is a possibility of the superconductivity induced in the graphene so we can modify the electron property of the graphene this is the main pursuit of this work but we don't have the direct uh, evidence for this because the Tyson temperature as we see it is around uh, below or around 10k this is a liquid helium temperature so there is a big chance of uh, missing and uh, one point i want to say is that we see graphene superconductivity this is very important but these are really useful that I can say this no. So we should uh, look for a higher temperature transition superconductivity to liquid helium or above near room temperature. It may come true in the near future. So uh, this is so the uh, core level XPS. Just I want to say one, uh, mention one point. At the magnesium peak, we found two magnesium peaks. One is the smaller one is coming from the intercalation, and the high density one is coming from the uh, upper layer. So with the variation of the coverage, the density peak is uh, keep on changing. So we, we can uh, correlate with our experimental result with this. As time promised, like, I want to mention some other graphene syn synthesis on other metal substrates. We synthesis graphene on copper 11 and iron 11 and others also. What I want to say is, according to different property, physical property of the graphene, we can use for different purposes. So graphene on copper 11 is used for photo photoluminescence study, and uh, graphene on iron uh, is used uh, to produce a different spin orientation because of the substrate iron uh, interaction. In the, here we see in the band structure, we observe uh, multi diracon As I mentioned uh, in the uh, previous slides, that the domain, graphene domains are uh, of oriented in different crystallographic uh, orientations. That's why we observe different uh, uh, Dirac cones here. I mentioned about the uh, Moir pattern. We observe a nice Moir pattern uh, in the intercalated case here. This is a bismuth intercalated graphene. Here we see nice moir pattern. Moir pattern is the periodic modulation uh, of the surface. So not only surface, there is more periodic modulation of the electronic levels, electronic structure. That's why it can affect to the graphene electronic properties. In the magnesium also, we observe a nice uh, moir patterns or super structures. And the below the uh, Bottom ones are the FFT of the corresponding STM topography. Now coming to the possible intercalation mechanism. We cannot ignore, we cannot say that graphene with which this is totally perfect. Definitely no. There is a point defect. Point defect is missing of the some atoms of the carbon. If we see the high profile taken in here, we see the deep 
that means some atom is missing and the tear between two graphene and uh, the joining uh, the grain boundaries so there is a chance that vaporized uh, metal atoms can stick through these holes or this crack region and, and below the graphene and they can form uh, and the crusted layers so this is a mechanism for intercalation if we confirm it uh, we do low coverage of uh, intercalated uh, metal atoms and we look for the uh, the broken boundary or these defects we found the first that the position is started here we see uh, the intercalated regions near to the and uh, the crack or boundaries so we confirm the mechanism here i would like to conclude the talk that i have discussed the synthesis of graphene on different metal substrates and uh, this graphene can be uh, decoupled from the graphene to restore the uh, Princeton electronic structure or build the Princeton band gap and we have discussed the possibility of phonon induced superconductivity in this system and the mechanism of the intercalation also have discussed i want to have a short discussion on uh, what we can use our intercalation technique to some other definitely before the layer materials like transition metal like across nice say mosu wsu2 there's a uh, tmds these layer materials we will introduce uh, intercalated layers then then we can single out one layer or mono layer then we can have the uh, signal electronic properties of the mono layer by layer that is a uh, must uh, different from the bulk property and uh, as the case of the GICs uh, if we intercalate uh, then there is possibility of, of inducing superconductivity so in the future there is a chance that we could have superconductors in high temperature transitions uh, higher transition temperatures we could have better superconductors thank you all Thank you so much, sir, for such informative talk. I'm sure our participants could be benefited by the lecture. So uh, now the session is open for discussion. So is there any question? Please type in the chat box. We'll put forward the question. Are there any questions from the participant side? Actually, uh, hello. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, hello. Sir, yes, yes. Uh, thank you for your beautiful talk. Uh, actually, I want to know something regarding uh, the graphene uh, graphene structure and the superconductivity and the Dirac cone, as you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. sir, uh, is it because of the geometry or something else? Uh, so what is what is the reason behind that uh, transition temperature increasing or decreasing uh, you have mentioned that by rotation magic by magic angles it mm -hmm. it, it, it will get decreased mm -hmm. so what will be the influence in the dirac cones uh, yes there yeah. now the dirac cone is modified this is because of the moir pattern just i mentioned that uh, let me explain what is moir pattern for example uh, the like these hands there's a periodic lines, EB, overlap and we rotate it slightly. Then we observe some other structure apart from this, apart from the mother structure. So such structures are called moir patterns. But in the case of the electron, there is modulation of the electrons because of this moir structure. That's why it can modify because of this moir potential, it can affect the electronic the band structure electronic property. From that, recently, uh, the MIT group uh, got uh, superconductivity and from this. One question in the beginning used all about the uh, um, properties of the graphene. Definitely, properties of the graphene is coming from the, this structure, hexagonal structure. So yes. most of the hexagonal structure have a more or less similar property. But definitely, carbon electronic property is also contributing, but the structure is very important. Yes. For the structure, uh, it can yeah. have uh, two atoms or uh, two atoms in the unicell. So yeah. these atoms correspond to the K and the K prime of the graphene uh, brilliant zone. 
Yes. So these two points are not equal. These points okay. are not equal because of the chirality. What is chirality? Let me explain this like the optical chirality. Uh, yes. The direction of the crystal momentum and the pseudo spin. There is one kind of spin in the graphene, not the real spin. That is pseudo spin. Pseudo spin is trying to align, but it may be along the direction or opposite to the direction of the uh, crystal momentum. This difference is called uh, chirality. In the K, they are aligned. In the K prime, they are opposed. They try okay. to align. So this is the chirality. These are coming from the structure. So it's okay. very important to be have a, this distinct and a very unique property of uh, graphene. And you know, so a pseudo spin I mentioned here. Pseudo yes. spin is uh, representing the there are two two triangular sublattices. There are six <laughs> six atoms, but if you divide into three. The yes, then they can be represented in the theoretical calculation. They can be represented by uh, different spinners. The egg is a real spin in the mathematical calculation. That's why they are called pseudo spin. So these are pseudo spin properties coming from the structure of the graphene. So these are the these are the origin of this fascinating property of graphene. But superconductivity is coming from the modification of this Benny structure. Why the okay. more pattern, more potential? Okay, sir. If this solid system, I mean, uh, if it is no electron, for example, with two combs are rotated each other, two parallel lines okay. rotate each other, we can modulate it because they are solid. But in the case of the electrons, no, yes, we can uh, they can modulate uh, the electron really. That's why okay. uh, they can affect really the electron activity of the graphene. Okay. Uh, sir, thank you for uh, uh, no, discussing. Okay. Actually, it's, nice. it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me. Yeah, actually, sir, uh, it will be due to the chiral structure of graphene, according to you. Chirality and other things. Sir, oh, yeah. is there a possibility of uh, some helical geometry or helical, uh, um, helical structures are also possible in topological insulators? So, mm -hmm. sir, is there some possibility of induced superconductivity there? Yes, in this superconductivity is in topology also. Uh, for example, if you put a, uh, if you put a, some superconductor, they can induce it. In this superconductivity okay. is there, but the concept is a little different. In that topology yes. is due to the uh, surface topology. You know, okay. in the topological material, material itself is insulator, but the yes, surface sir. is state. Surface is only in the surface. Yes. Sir. So. Surface is studied, is studied in the surface sign, so we need to use uh, uh, STM or RFS to see this, observe this uh, Benny okay. okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any more queries? Any more questions from the participant sides? Hello, sir. Hello, Hello sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So, since uh, is there any question from the participant side? Please put. Please take the means opportunity to interact with the speakers, and our speaker is very excellent in experiment and physics, and he has published a lot of paper, has done a remarkable work. So, please take the opportunity to interact with him. Any question from the participant side, please. Oh. Yes, there is no any questions. We would like to thank Dr. Tombo Singh for giving your valuable time for interacting with the participants and your wonderful talk, sir. And we hope forward to look you to get you in future also. Please cooperate with us. Please share your experience to our participants in the coming seminars. Thank you once again. I took the opportunity to thank you, Dr. Tombo Singh. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. So well, with this, we uh, would like to move forward with our next lecture. Our next invited speaker is Dr. Sayed Arshad Hussain, Tripura University, Tripura.
and his topic of discussion is nano dimensional clay materials the ideal host material to manipulate the properties of organic molecules let me give a brief introduction about our speaker dr s a hussain is an associate professor of physics at tripura university his major fields of interest are thin film and nano science organo clay hybrid frdt biosensor biometric surfaces he was a postdoctoral fellow of ku loben belgium during 2007 and 8 he has undertaken several research projects funded by dst csir dae ugc etc dr hussein has published more than 130 research papers in, in international journals written three books and edited four books he is working as editorial board member of applied clay science elsevier helion recent pattern in nanotechnology bentham science micro and nano system bentham science nano science and nanotechnology asia bentham science dr hussein has already guided 10 phd scholars and 3 mphil students at present several students are working under his supervision he has visited 11 countries and attended several scientific conferences in india and abroad he earned several recognitions in professional area few of them are jagdish chandra bose award 2008-9 tscst government of tripura young scientist research award by dae and dst government of india visiting scientist by ku lubin belgium best paper award in 96th isca felicitation by asiatic society of bangladesh etc so i'd like to hand over the platform to dr sayed arshad hussain sir please are you there yes uh, good morning so can you hear me yes sir we can hear you <laughs> okay so what we will do first share uh, my presentation Uh, i hope uh, the slides are visible yes sir okay so uh, good morning to you all uh first of all i would like to thank my friend professor indrajit and uh, the organizer from assam university for uh, giving me an opportunity to interact with the researchers of this regions uh, and uh, even also from outside india and share some of my words so uh, during uh, presentation i will stop the video so that uh, uh, the communication should be in a proper way uh, sometimes network creates problem okay and uh, if uh, at any moment of then please let me know or uh, dr sharma can call me also because when sharing the slide sometimes difficult you know in mode a lot of advantage disadvantage also sometimes sometimes we are uh going just speaking but network stops so i don't want uh, this situations so please feel free to communicate so uh let's stop the video okay so the topic of my uh, talk is nano dimensional clay minerals ideal host to minerals of organic molecules and and uh, 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 and to first in the the start is web poetry and you uh, presently the word nano or nanotechnology is a buzz and you know in principle 
from scientific point of view, you know, one one meter is equal to ten to the power minus nine meter, and it's really difficult to see the you know, structures, even with uh, with the help of machine. Also, it's very really difficult. You need very costly, sophisticated equipment. But now, people are excited about the term you know, and you know. Uh, we are uh, very well known about this car. It's known as nano car, but the size of the car is more than meter. But why nano? Because nano is very lucrative car. You know, it itself is a uh, brand and has commercial value. So whatever is small, this car is maybe one of the smallest car. So company term it as nano. Why? To market the uh, word nano. Typically, uh, the hair uh, diameter of hair is of the order of 0.1 millimeter, and this is equal to 100,000 nanometer. So you see the uh, uh, the dimension of nano, and we all know uh, from uh, internet or other lectures have a lot of you know terminology about no, not going in this issue. So my topic, clay minerals, today I am going to share my work in this area. And clay minerals, a natural nanomaterial. So before uh, starting uh, uh, the present or today's topic, let's share uh, what we are doing. In our lab, uh, we do say study of fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer, Main aim is to identify new FRED pair, designing various FRED based optical sensor. And already we have designed several sensor, arsenic sensor, hard water sensor, pH sensor, ion sensor, cholesterol sensor, etc. Then we do study organic switching. And main aim is to apply organic materials for memory devices. And already we have designed some organic or some hybrid structure can be used for ROM or like uh, devices. Similarly, we do study on uh, molecular aggregates. Uh, main interest is to explore new nanomaterials with different functionalities, that is having same biosensing, catalysis, optics, electronics, etc. And these are uh, related publications. And uh, uh, to do this kind of uh, study, mainly we prepare organic or other materials uh, uh, using onto thin films. And for this, we use uh, several techniques, for example, Legmore project technique, layer by layer self assembly, spin coating, vacuum deposition, suction uh, for sending film, etc. And for characterizations, we use. Uh, some optical instruments, for example, UV is absorbed, fluorescence, FTIR, etc. For electrical characterizations, uh, we use several source meters, and then for morphology or structural study, we use F, M, M, etc. And materials interested in organic, polymeric, biomolecules, lipid, protein, enzyme, DNA, minerals, etc. These are instruments we have. Uh, most are in my lab, and some are NMR, liquid nitrogen plants, etc. And uh, FSA, these are central facility. So let's uh, go to uh, the topic organoclear systems. We all know the term soil. Soil is alive with living organism. It supports life with its naturally occurring nutrients, its minerals. It's, it's a for living system, specifically planting system. It is a complete
drying and due to these issues it has gained lot of importance field of on industries cookery pot making applications cosmetics electronics biomedical etc however we are, we are interested in organoclay hybrid systems why to pull it the properties to play with the proper of organic materials so that it can be applied to uh, uh, for optoelectric devices now let's have a small introduction what is clay minerals clay minerals represent important group of layered inorganic solid materials they swell in aqueous environment uh, into single states of the order of thickness 1 nanometer diameter 1 to 2 micrometer they have lot of interesting properties including colloidal size high cation exchange capacities large surface areas surface activities adsorptive properties high viscosity and transparency another important property is intercalation that is uh, one can incorporate simultaneously the polar ionic as well as neutral molecules in between the interlamellar space or the surface of the clay mineral and this intercalation property of clay gives us the opportunity to make organic inorganic hybrid material clay minerals mainly formed by negatively by layering of negatively charged aluminosilicate layer the layers are mainly sheets of tetrahedra of si4 plus the sio4 and then sheets of octahedra of aluminum magnesium and uh, this ferric oxides and sharing or combination of these layers forms and also uh, uh, the types of means one tetrahedron layer that is silica layer and then one octahedral layer then two is to one clay tetrahedral layer then uh, this tetrahedra then again tetrahedra so this is uh, uh, and uh, basic building blocks of clay minerals are already uh, tetrahedrons and tetrahedrons so this is a uh, si for unit repeat unit of this sio4 forms silica tetrahedral sheets similarly alumina this is uh, uh, alumina octahedrons and one of this unit forms this alumina octahedron sheet electron uh, ions and then molecules it forms sheet tetra tetrahedra and uh, this sheet upon sheet forms layer and layer upon layer forms crystal and layering of silica and alumina sheets together their space already i told and the ratios are like this one silica layer is to one alumina that means one layer two silica one alumina this is again uh, another layer and this is schematically shown this is silica tetrahedron this is silica layer this is alumina tetrahedron this is alumina layer silica tetrahedron then layer and layering uh, uh, upon this layer uh, forms this kind of structures and repetition of this kind of structures form the crystals these are some examples major clay minerals kaolinite groups these are 1 is to 1 pyotite clay then mica groups these are 2 is to 1 pyotite clay uh, Uh, some stacks monolite these are two is one the minerals uh, these are some uh, examples now one of the interesting properties of clay is swelling when you put your clay into the aqueous medium it swells into even single sheet that is either whose thickness of the order of nanometers so this is one important property swelling See, and uh, 
the main mechanism lying this swelling is maybe hydration. This is one uh, issue, and then another pressure difference between in between clay layers and outside the environment that is in solvent. And due to these two difference in pressures, osmotic uh, swelling occurred. That is. Uh, solvent from outside entered in between the clay space and swelling that is sheets or layer separated from each other and swells into even up to single sheets. Then another issue, intercalations. That is one can incorporate uh, different types of uh, materials in between clay layer or upon the clay surface. So by swelling, one can prepare even single sheet. This is called exfoliation. And then one can incorporate this uh, organic, polymeric, or biomolecule uh, on the surface of the sheet or in between the uh, uh, layer or sheets. So depending on this, one can prepare different types of structures and of course having different types of property. Another issue is cation exchange capacity. And this is the total capacity of a soil to hold exchangeable cations. And uh, it depends uh, 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 on the uh, uh, absorption cap uh, capability. The, the, this is the cations existing in between the clay layer or on the surface. And there is a order uh, that is a rate of adsorption, and, and this is called lytrotic series. And uh, this cation exchange uh, is mainly the inter uh, interchange between a cation in the solution that is what uh, what type of cation you want to incorporate in the clay and another cation in the soil surface. So one can incorporate or place desired types of cations onto the or in between the clay layer. And uh, the clay minerals have negatively charged sites on their surface. This also absorbs and hold positively charged ion by uh, electrolytic interactions and main exchangeable cations are calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, etc. present on the clay surface or in between the clay layers. And CEC or cation exchange capacity is conventionally expressed in mega equivalent per gram. So this is uh, uh, some schematic of structure that is one can incorporate this uh, uh, foreign material that is organic or biomaterial or polymeric, you see uh, uh, in between the clay sheet or these are intercalated clay layer and then again layer, some on the surface, in between the surface and uh, sheets is possible. But of course, what you have to do, you have to play with the environment, then you can prepare different types of this kind of structures. So our, uh, you know, current work on organoclave uh, systems are mainly to explore new organoclave hybrid nano systems with different functionalities for example sensing biosensing optics electronics etc and uh, we do study to have idea about the organization of clay particles and adsorbed materials in these uh, hybrid organoclave systems uh, we try to explore the fundamental behavior of clay as well as dye in such systems then we try to do some uh, investigation on energy transfer uh, among dyes in such systems. As a whole, uh, we try to have idea about the, this hybrid film formations uh, in such systems. And uh, recently, we are uh, trying to design some supramolecular systems having uh, some color colorimetric behavior under different uh, environment so that it can be used as optical memory or colorimetric sensing application. So I will share some examples. Uh, these are uh, some optical sensors based on organoclay uh, hybrid systems recently we uh, have done. And these are some uh, supramolecular systems we designed using different types of clay and organic materials. Now why this organoclay thin films? The planarity of the pi conjugated systems of the confined organic molecule is increased when you incorporate them in between the clay layers or on the surface. That means it extends the pi conjugation length 
Also, the fluorescence quantum yield of the dyes is enhanced when you incorporate them in between the clay layers. Why? Because uh, you can uh, suppress the vibrational motion by confining them within the clay layers. So this behavior, these two properties mainly help you to manipulate the optical behavior or electronic behavior of your dyes incorporated in such systems. A clay mineral can accommodate a large number of organic molecules in its interlayer space without aggregation. Also, what you can do, you can play with the gallery height, the height of the, that is space between the clay layers by uh, manipulating the, uh, the environment. Also, one can uh, control the organizations of uh, the incorporated material by playing or manipulating the environment. Accordingly, organic molecules confined in clay organic hybrid systems exhibit unique electronic properties that are not observed in their solution or crystalline states. So in this cartoons, uh, I have shown the organization that is there exist two types of organization, the organization of clay particles and organic molecules in the films. So this is your clay, this is your organic systems and the organization of organic molecules adsorbed on the clay surface, this one. So if you can play with these two organizations, you can play with the polyelectronic behavior of your organic systems. So in this cartoon I have shown, one can uh, play with the dipole moment of the incorporated material in between the clay layer based on the organizations. Here you can say the moments not equal to zero, but here zero, here again not equal to zero, but it is different from the first one. Here you see organization is different, but the moments is zero. Similarly here also, here also. So as a whole, by uh, changing the arrangement of your incorporated material, you can play with the uh, 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 property of the material. So this is uh, interesting. For thin film preparations, we do use Langmuir Blodgett technique, self standing films, spin coating technique, layer by layer self assembled techniques, mainly for this organoclear hybrid film uh, for, for film preparations. So these are some instruments. This is uh, LV Langmuir Blodgett film deposition systems. Here, main part is this trough where material is spread. And this is the sys computer system. You can control the, uh, the uh, compression or deposition of the molecules into the substrate using uh, this uh, software controlling this computer. Here, it's attached with fluorescence imaging microscope facility. You can uh, study the organizations or the whole process uh, when spread in the trough using this microscope. This is again Brewster angle microscopy you can have idea about the organization of the material uh, on the surface using this machine. Here, uh, light is allowed to fall at the angle of Brewster angle for the interface, air and water. And, uh, you know, and, and at that uh, point, all light transmit through the surface. But if some material is there, then the reflective interest change according to the Brewster angle change, so some lights reflected back and one can catch using this detector this, this reflected light and this is uh, proportional with the arrangement of the material so one can have indirect idea about the organization uh, of, of the floating material so these instruments are available in our lab uh, here i just uh, demonstrate uh, this how we prepare a, a film using lv so this is the trough where you spread the molecules and this is, you know, this water plant floating on the surface. What we do, we uh, make dilute solution using chloroform or the other volatile solvent, then we spread and it's li uh, uh, lie like this water plant. Then we compress using this computer controlled barrier, then, then come close to each other. Then we uh, deposit this uh, film onto solid substrate for study or application, whatever may be. And this deposition process is, you know, uh, we all uh, have seen the cream when milk is heated, you see a cream layer form. And if you dip a spoon and take out, you will see cream 
attach on the uh, surface of the spoon. Same thing uh, happened here. But the main issue one has to remember, it's very you know, precise because you are transferring molecule. And in principle, using these techniques, one can prepare a layer of the order of one molecule thick. You know, by discovering this technique, Arvind Langmuir uh, got Nobel Prize in 1935. And of course, this uh, transfer process, you know, is looks very easy, but it depends on a lot of factors. For example, property of your substrate, then uh, property of your uh, surface, that is temperature, pH, so many issues are there. You know, minute change can affect the properties or organizations. So one has to be very careful. So, uh, and uh, how we prepare this organoclase system using this LV technique? What we do, first we prepare clay dispersion using this magnetic stirrer for 24 hours. Then we put this dispersion on uh, ultrasonic attack. Then we depose, uh, uh, put uh, this dispersion on the uh, trough of the LV instrument. And we spread some uh, cationic amphiphile on the surface. Clay material lie in the surface. Uh, surface. When they come close with this floating material, they attach through a cation exchange reaction or electrostatic interactions. Then we compress the barrier and depending on the organization, whatever we want, we transfer the film on the solid support. This is one process and another process is we gently you know, take the substrate close to the material and it touches, then material attach on the substrate and we take out, then we study. But it depends on the property of your substrate and of course your material. And during this film pre uh, preparations, the clay material, floating clay material come close to the amphiphile and this is a time dependent process. One can study this absorption process by infrared reflection absorption spectroscopy. Here, this light is allowed to fall on the surface and the reflected light is recorded using a detector. And with the time, you know, clay materials come on the surface. That is, surface thickness increases. So reflected light amount increases. Accordingly, intensity of your, uh, this vibration of the corresponding band increases, so one can have idea. So this is shown here. You see, this is the vibration uh, of the SIO band of this uh, uh, silicon tetrahedron when incorporated on the surface during this hybridization process. And you, you can see the plot of intensity with time. Initially, it increases and after some time, it flattens. That means after some time, all the clay materials has come on, up onto the surface and interaction is complete. Then you can transfer your material on the substrate for further application or investigations. By AFM also one can have the visual idea. You see, this is a AFM image of a film prepared after five minutes. And here the same, you know, film prepared after 30 minutes. And you can see the density of clay material here, it's higher. So one can have idea about the uh, this absorption process and it's typically a time dependent process. This is another uh, technique. This is called self-standing technique. Here what we do, we mix the clay dispersion and the organic material uh, of your interest and then mix, uh, put on the uh, this mixer, magnetic stator, then we put ultrasonic and then we use a simple systems there is a membrane uh, and uh, of the order of say fraction of micrometer pore size and then we put the mixture here and we suck using a uh, vacuum pump then uh, with time uh, solvent comes here and the material form a layer on the membrane we take out the membrane peel out the film on the glass substrate or whatever uh, you want even a plastic also you can transfer so this is a simple process and spin coating you all know uh, we spread the mixture of the clay and uh, dye systems uh, on the substrate and it's spun uh, using a motor 
and it uh, of course fits with a, a vacuum pumps so that it should not you know uh, go out and based on the speed and time of rotation one can have uh, the film here so it's a very simple process but of course the control or preciseness of the on the thickness is not so well controlled as uh, you know by lv system this is again layer by layer uh, self assemble system what we do we uh, negatively charge the slides using some treatment then we put into the uh, dye solutions take out throw in extra interactions the dye are absorbed on the surface then we wash and then we dry then we put the film on the clay uh, dispersion then pro cationic reaction or electrostatic interactions this clay attached with this dyes and you uh, then again we take out you know and then we wash dry so this is one by layer of dye and clay and repeating the whole process one can have desired thickness desired number of layers on the substrates these are some fm image representative fm image of different uh, clay this is saponite leponite wyoming again saponite hectorite and you can see the thickness is less than 2 nanometer of these films so it's really nanometer dimension and interesting thing is that these are natural materials so let's uh, take one example so this is a clay organic hybrid systems and it exhibits reversible fluorescence color switching suitable for secret writing applications and uh, this is a study is done using a clay this is saponite and a organic material pyridinium derivative so five derivative uh, you know studied but out of this this molecule showed very good results so i will uh, share some very uh, uh, some results using this dp dp molecule so using self standing film we prepared a film uh, at different concentration so this first column is uh, the image uh, captured with a simple normal camera maybe mobile camera or other uh, you know camera for film organic organoclear hybrid films prepared the saponite and pyridinium at different concentration this is 0.05 this is 1% of cec this is 10% uh, this percentage of cec means if the cec that is your clay can exchange 100 say cations then we exchange 10 cations that is 10 charged dyes this is 10% of cec then 20% of cec then again this line you see 30 percent 40 percent this kind of things this is just simple image just after preparation taken by a mobile camera then what we did we expose this using normal light the second column you see the spr and normal light image are same you can see here but when we expose this film under uv just using a uv torch and then we recorded the image using the same camera mobile camera you can see in the last column color change occurred so we take uh, this main color change was prominent at 10 percent of cc you see it's blue then normal light again blue but under uv it you see deep uh, or dark yellow so we analyze the why this color change happened so this uh, we did some spectroscopic studies and we see uh, for these are absorption spectra before and after uv exposure the spectra remains almost same but in case of fluorescence interesting result was observed you know before uh, exposure uv exposure you see the uh, band lies at 485 nanometer but after exposure you can see the band shifted to 600 nanometer and it becomes very broad and it's uh, situated in longer wavelength corresponding to the original uh, one and these features are mainly the characteristics of excimer excimer is some kind of aggregations and uh, when an excited state molecules come to the ground state molecules uh, uh, of the order of say 0.35 nanometer uh, uh, close uh, closer then excimer forms 
and excitement is an excited state phenomena because you need an excited state molecule. So absorption is a since absorption is a ground state phenomena, you cannot see any change before exposure, after exposure. But in fluorescence, you see the change after exposure. So again, we studied uh, uh, further to have idea or confirm this hypothesis. What we did, we measured the fluorescence lifetime for this original band and the band shifted after exposure. And we have seen that the lifetime of the new band is 18 times longer than the original band. So, and again, this is the characteristic of the XIMR and because it is a metastable system. Then we uh, studied the system using XRD. What we have seen, the thickness, layer thickness, gap between the layers, clay layers for as prepared films that is without UV was of the order of 0.4 nanometer. And this 4 nanometer, 4.48 nanometer is the uh, thickness of the, you know, uh, 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 pi uh, 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 flattened organization of single uh, pyridinium molecule. But in swollen state, the th uh, gap was observed to the 0.93. And uh, this is uh, uh, equal to the uh, two molecules when stacked together. So this confirms that in when in uh, 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 dry conditions, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell one thing uh, here. Uh, this is uh, UV uh, uh, and this normal experiment was done using, uh, we put some solvent on the SPP film, then we did this experiment. This is after normal light, then UV light. I forgot to uh, tell this. Uh, so when we put some solvent, then swelling occurred. That is due to swelling, the gap between the clay layers increases and two molecules comes in between the layer and form pi pi stack and form excimer. And uh, we have seen that this process is solvent independent. Whatever solvent we put, water we studied with water, DMSO, chloroform, whatever may be, we have seen that similar result was obtained. But we prefer DMSO because it has high uh, boiling point. Uh, so it can remain for long time. That, that is why we prefer DMSO. So again, uh, this is SPP film. This is swollen that is put some DMSO. Then we expose with UV light, then we record it. But without UV, color was similar. So swollen, this is yellow. Then what we did, we wash it with water to take out the DMSO. Then we, again, we dry. Same thing, you see the color returns. And we studied this uh, uh, process. Uh, you see, this is the uh, uh, repetition of uh, uh, color and this uh, so due to drying and swelling. And we have seen that this is a reversible process. And here, Schematically, it's shown in normal process, this is SPPR, one molecule within the clay layer, but in swelling, when we put DMSO, then the gap between the layer increases, so two molecules stack together and form excimer. So accordingly, this uh, fluorescence uh, property change that uh, occurred longer wavelength band and when uh, UV torch, then color. So from this, we propose one application. This is, you see, SPPR, film, then we put some DMSO. What we did using a hearing bud, we just dip on DMSO or any solvent and we write TU on this film. Then we uh, uh, observe with normal light, under visible light. You see in this image, bottom image, no color change. But same film after writing, when we expose it with a UV light, then one can see that TU. That is, under normal light, this TU retained using DMSO is not observable because swelling after swelling, because when we write using DMSO, swelling occurred in the part of the film where this bud touches. And under this area, excimer uh, formed due to swelling, but since it's an excited state phenomena, under normal light, it's not visible. When we expose it using UV, one can see it and uh, one can uh, read it. But again, one can wash it, dry it. One can
have the original color back. So we propose it suitable for secret writing. Th then here, another example, this is an uh, uh, imidazole uh, uh, derivative and uh, again mixed with saponite clay and we see in normal condition, this is colorless, but in dry condition, this is red and then in swollen condition, you see the yellow and simultaneous drying and swelling, it's possible to uh, 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 have back this red and uh, yellow color. So it's reversible in nature. So this is at different concentrations. Uh, we uh, studied this color change and you see this is reversible in nature. And here color change is mainly in normal conditions, it's colorless when we heat it, the due to drying the gallery height, thickness between the clay layer decreases so a molecule become maximum flat that is pi conjugation length increases so it becomes red but when we swell it by putting any solvent uh, the gap increases little bit so and twisting of this band occur there is conjugation changes according to the color change occur. so we confirm it by spectroscopy as well as measuring xrd and some morphological study also Schematically here shown, this is in normal, freshly prepared films. In, uh, uh, you see the thick, uh, gap of the order of 0.636 nanometer. Then in uh, dry condition, it's lower, 0.538 nanometer, so maximum flat. Again, in swelling with DMSO, you can see 0.85 nanometer. Gap increases, so molecule, some twisting occurred, accordingly color change occurred. So this is uh, very good for optical, uh, you know, memory applications. Then uh, we studied some clay PDA systems and we propose application for alcohol sensor. PDA is a polydiacetylene uh, polymer. It's actually formed from diacetylene. When diacetylene is exposed uh, under UV, uh, they polymerize. Actually, it's a photochemical uh, polymerization, chemistry people know better. Mm. Uh, then it forms PDA. And PDA has two phases. One is blue phases and one is red phases. An interesting thing is that these two phases has unique spectroscopy properties. For example, this is absorption spectra. This is for blue phase. This is for red phase. This is again fluorescence. For blue phase, you see almost no fluorescence, red phase. Uh, very high fluorescence. So what one can do, the main importance of this PDA is that once you prepare your uh, PDA in blue phase and then you expose this under different stimuli, for example, heat or under different, uh, you know, external perturbation for UV or presence of other material. And if it changes its phases from blue to red, you will see the change and it's observable under naked eye, this blue and red phase. So this material is very suitable for colorimetric applications, naked eye applications. So in this example, what I am showing, we use some uh, one organic material and then clay and then PDA. It's a mixture and uh, uh, we uh, uh, prepare the film using self-standing systems and this is an uh, image recorded using the simple camera. First what we did, exposing the system under UV, we transferred it into blue phase. Then you can see this A image, this is just blue phase image recorded. Then we expose this film under alcohol and you can see the color change. In presence of alcohol, the, the PDA phase changes from blue to red and this color change is observed by naked eye and the first image you see film after five times puff after one hour of consumption of two pack alcohol and then in C1 this is you see even after several hours if you put it in front of some drunk people you can see the color change so it's a naked eye uh, colorimetric sensor it's a just simple piece kind of paper piece and you just put in front of a drunk people or alcohol you will see the color change you can have idea and this is the corresponding you know structural change this is before exposure 
and this is after exposure. This polymerization changes from blue to red, so you see the structural change. In uh, nor normally in market, you know, available alcohol sensor is mainly uh, 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 conductivity or resistivity based. Uh, actually, they use some material. Uh, it has very high resistivity in absence of alcohol. When exposed in presence of alcohol, the resistivity increases. That is current uh, flow through the material increases. And uh, uh, for these kind of systems, what you have to you need, you need some kind of battery, then current meter, then you have to calibrate. So it needs a lot of devices and of course it's costly. But in our system, only a piece of paper, you just observing the change in color, you can have idea. Uh, and of course, for calibration, what you have to do, you have to take the image of your uh, film and then you have to take the uh, RGB color combinations from different pixels. And if you analyze with simple algorithm, then you can have idea about the concentration also. But work is going on to have precise idea about the constant color change with the concentrations. Then uh, we did some, uh, I am showing some results on uh, FRET fluorescence resonance energy transfer studies using clay systems. Uh, these are corresponding some uh, uh, of our recent publications. Energy transfer is an electrodynamic phenomena where uh, one molecule takes energy from the source, then it non-radiatively transfer its whole energy or a part of energy to the nearby other molecule and it ex go to excited state, then it's released the photon with uh, uh, some emission. So this is written as here, D plus H nu, then D star, D star A, D A star, A star, it releases a photon. So you will excite molecule D and you will see emission from molecule A. But of course, several factors are there it's a distance dependent phenomena and the distance between typically donor acceptor should be less than 10 nanometer and this distance is of the order of molecular dimensions so one can have idea about the molecular organizations by studying fret also so this is one issue and there are other criteria for fret to occur these are for example donor molecule should be very uh, highly fluorescent should be very high quantum yield there should be sufficient overlap between the fluorescence spectrum of the donor and the absorption spectrum and also spectral uh, orientation is also a, a very important factor. So I am not going details into that. The extent of energy transfer depends upon several factors. For example, distance between the donor and acceptor, relative orientation of the molecules, acceptor transition dipoles and also spectral overlap. If presence of any external agents affect these above factors accordingly what happens extent of energy transfer from donor to acceptor changes and in other way by observing the change in energy transfer efficiency or extent in energy transfer one can have idea about the presence of external agents so this gives you idea that one can have uh, uh, optical sensor using this process but this is a you know, uh, uh, two fluorescence systems. Uh, in single fluorescence uh, uh, system, it's only, you know, when you design sensors, optical sensors using single fluorescence systems, your fluorescence intensity increases or decreases. Just by observing the change, you can have idea about the sensing. But here, two systems. For donor, fluorescence will decrease because it's giving energy to the acceptor. For acceptor, energy will increase. So it's a ratio between two fluorescence of two molecules and in this way, if there is any external perturbations or contamination, etc., there, it automatically minimizes because it measures the ratio between two fluorescence intensities. So it's very advantageous. So one example, we studied energy transfer between a thiocyanin uh, derivative and a rudamine derivative. And we have observed that in normal solution, no energy transfer occurred. But when the material transfer into films, LB films, energy transfer occurred 64%. That is NK absorb energy from the source, direct excitations, 
the, and it transfer a part of this to the acceptor and normally we calculated the efficiency in absence of uh, clay it was 64.2 percent but in presence of clay we found that efficiency increases 97.7 percent this is because clay in presence of clay these dye molecules are absorbed in between the clay layer or the clay surface accordingly distance you see in this table we calculated the distance between the donor and acceptor and you see in presence of uh, in absence of clay the distance was of the order of uh, 13.4 and then in presence of clay it is 8.36 so you see distance changes accordingly extent of energy transfer changes also orientation also you see uh, uh, in case of uh, clay it increases orientation factor then this is another uh, example we studied the same thing using acroflavin and rudamine and you see in absence of clay energy transfer efficiency was 11.37 percent but in clay dispersion it's 78.17 percent almost seven times enhancement in the energy transfer efficiency here we have just shown you see this system is in absence of clay you see this is your red one rudamine this black one is say your uh, thiocyan and derivatives you see distance is of the uh, uh, 8 nanometer efficiency of energy transfer is 11.37 percent but in presence of clay you see this molecular adsorbed on the clay surface distance decreases of the order of say 5.33 nanometer compared to this 8.07 and you see efficiency increases 78 up to 78 percent and of course orientation factor overlay factor these are also important based on this using these two molecules we designed several sensors for example hard water sensors in hard water actually is based on the presence of some cations in your water magnesium calcium etc and there is some standard definition if your concentration is less than this we say soft water in between this we say it's moderately hard water higher than this we say very hard water so what we did we studied the energy transfer between these two molecules in presence of different concentration of these two cations and we calibrate uh, these are two molecules we used for energy transfer uh, you can see uh, this acroflubin and rudamine energy transfer uh, this is 11.37 percent then we studied the same in presence of calcium magnesium ions you see energy transfer decreases but it decreases from 11.37 to 1.7 or 5.7 or 4.38 depending on the presence of calcium magnesium or both ions but the decrease is very less then what we did we put some clay in between these two dye system then initially energy transfer increases up to 78 then we put the uh, ions calcium magnesium or both then you see decrease is from 78 to 37 78 to 51 then 78 to 48 and these are resol well resolvable. So here, uh, presence of clay mainly help us to increase the, uh, the sensitivity of the systems. And this schematically we shown, this is the, you see in normal system, distance is very large. So in clay, we incorporated these dyes, they are closely spaced, so efficiency increases. For sensing what we did, first we, uh, put the clay in, in the ions, then already ions are absorbed in, in the clay layer. Then we put this uh, ion adsorbed clay system on the dyes, then dye are absorbed. But in that case, all, since already some ions are absorbed in between the clay, so dye are less closely spaced compared to the earlier one. So efficiency decreases. So based on this decrease, one can have idea, one can calibrate. So these are change in intensity uh, efficiency with presence of magnesium calcium or both ions you see almost linear then we uh, uh, analyze this thing and based on the efficiency we have this kind of plot if the efficiency is say for uh, greater than 48 percent then we say it's soft water if the efficiency is in between 13.5 to 48.2 we say it moderately hard water if it is less than 13.5, we say very hard water. 
Similarly, we have already uh, demonstrated uh, use of this organoplast system in designing arsenic sensor, ion sensor, DNA sensor, cholesterol sensor, pH sensor, etc. So I am not going in details into that. One, if somebody interested, then can he can study. If, uh, is all given in my website also. Then uh, I am showing some example on the influence of play on the second harmonic generation. Second harmonic generation is very interesting. You know, it's a nonlinear phenomena and it's a lot of applications for, for example, laser, uh, then second harmonic microscopy to have idea about the organizations of the nonlinear materials and so many other issues. So in our case, what we did, we prepare some uh, uh, J aggregates of uh, organic material using LB systems. And then we demonstrated that it's possible to have this second harmonic using this kind of system. One of the pre-requirement for this second harmonic generation is the system should be non-centrosymmetric. If your molecule is intrinsically non-centrosymmetric, you will have this SHJ. But using uh, uh, LB system, if you prepare J aggregates, then even symmetric molecule can show uh, uh, as a whole non centrosymmetry structure and you, one can have SHG activity. So this is, you see, in uh, uh, we did some uh, 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 J aggregates uh, using LB film. This is, you see, two layer of uh, the molecules in J aggregates in LB systems and it's uh, first layer, two molecules, you see, stacked. And if you draw a line, you will see it's uh, non central symmetry across this line. But if you prepare another layer upon first layer, this two layer, then you see this part and this part similar, this part, this part, so it's symmetry. So if you prepare even symmetric molecule in one layer, one layer may be stack of more than one molecule, it does not matter because the aggregates are head to tail arrangement of molecules in a specific order. So if you prepare one layer, even more than one molecule stacking in J aggregates in LB film, then this is non centrosymmetric structure and one can have SHG activity. So this is the J aggregate uh, optical behavior of J aggregates. J aggregates mainly show red shifted bands, very, you know, zero, almost zero stroke shift, very sharp. Uh, these are some characteristics. So for nonlinear optical activity, we use a laser and DYAG, uh, wavelength 1064, then power of the order of this 400 milliwatt. So what we did, first we, we exposed this J aggregate under this laser and we see how the stability, because you know in LB system, the stability is very less sometimes because it's based on electrotics, uh, uh, is based on the uh, uh, Van der Waals system. So what we, uh, you can see this green one is uh, stability of the systems uh, measured uh, with time without exposure. But when we expose, you see red line decreases. This is for uh, uh, single layer. Then again, we did is for 10 layer. But when we measured, uh, we prepared the system in presence of clay, one can see the stability enhances. And you can see here the uh, SHG signals, intensity is black one from the uh, freshly prepared films, this N uh, thiocyanine field, J aggregate films in LB system. Then after seven days, we measured the same uh, SHG intensity, you can see it decreases. But when we prepared the system in presence of clay, you can see the black one freshly prepared. Then after seven days, uh, you see the intensity decrease is very less compared to this one. So here, uh, the clay helps us to enhance the mechanical stability of the J aggregate in LB field. And we have seen that the stability even, uh, it remains almost stable even um, after months also. So uh, here, rule of clay is mainly to bind electrotically or through cation exchange reaction to give the stability of the system. Uh, this is another uh, system example. Here you can see does uh, this is without uh, without clay SHG intensity you see it's lower but in presence of clay SHG intensity is very higher. 
So, in conclusion, we can say that clay materials are very promising for preparing organoclay hybrid supramolecular structure. Controlling the organization in such film may lead to maximization of properties such as polarometric switching, FRED, J aggregation, SHG, nonlinear optical activity, etc. Organoclay hybrid films are very promising for future technological applications. Uh, I acknowledge few of uh, my students, some of them already done PhD and some are doing. So they did this, all these experiments, these are funding and these are my uh, collaborators. So thank you. Thank you all for your kind listening. So uh, with that, I conclude my lecture. If you uh, have any query, you can ask me. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for enlightening us with such informative, informative talk. Uh, now the session is open for discussion. If there are any queries, uh, you can uh, put it in chat box or, or you can uh, turn on your mic and ask also. Participants, uh, participants, please kindly uh, put questions to our expert. Dr. Archid Hussain is a very eminent speaker and working in this area. He is a very well-known person in India, particularly in this nanoscience and nanotechnology. Let us take the advantage from the speaker. Please come forward with your questions. It is very difficult to catch them, these speakers. Please come forward your questions. Uh, there are some questions, uh, messages from uh, to my mobile. They could not connect it. Uh, sir, yes. Hello. There are some yes, questions. Yes. Uh, there are some questions uh, from the uh, participants. There are, uh, they want to know how to prepare the thin films in the noise scale. Okay. So there are several techniques. You know, main issue is for nanodimension. You cannot see it. You cannot uh, 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 hold it with your hands. So you need sophisticated instruments. And also in nano dimension, you see there are other issues. For example, when you take two molecules close to each other, there are so many interactions also. They assemble, you know, uh, by their own. This is called self-assembly. For example, capillary reactions, electrode interaction, Van der Waals interaction, etc. So you need special techniques. And there are lot of techniques. For example, I told Langmuir budget technique, uh, spin coating technique, vacuum deposition technique, uh, 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 chemical uh, bath deposition technique, sputtering technique. Uh, uh, so depending on your requirement, each technique has your advantage and disadvantage. For example, if you want to prepare a nano layer of organic material, which is uh, water insoluble amphibolic material. Then what you do, you then you use LB technique. In that technique, what do you do? You just prepare dilute solution of your material using some volatile solvent, for example, chloroform. Then you put the solution dropwise from very close to the water surface in the water. Because in the LB instruments, there is a trough, you will fill it with water. Then you allow some time. Chloroform is water insoluble. It will evaporate since it is volatile. Then you compress. I give you the example. It's like this water plant. You, if, if there is water plant in your pond, and if you compress using a bamboo, then you will see they will come closer to each other. And at certain time, they will touch each other and form almost a, a compact film. If you further compress, then you will see some plant will go uh, below the bamboo or it will go over this is that means layer will collapse here also similar you will compress 
using a computer control systems and you monitor how closely they are packed and depending on the requirement how compact you want you transfer it but of course if you uh, during this compression you have to be careful for several factors it may collapse also because uh, it's of the order of nano small impurity or small vibration or small uh, change in speed also will change the organizations then once it's a compact system <coughs> floating layer then you transfer it into solid substance again i give you example it's like you know uh, heated milk there is cream you dip a spoon take out you will see the layer will stick on the surface but of course uh, in uh, in organic you have to be careful because you cannot see it, its molecular dimension a small vibration in the substrate while taking out or change in the environment will change the organization and the properties also so this is one system for example you want to prepare a layer of say metallic material then what you can do you can use say vacuum depositions you, in high vacuum passing through uh, passing current you will change the, uh, the heat of some filament and you will put your material in uh, in between or close to the filament your material will melt and due to vacuum it will spread all direction you will put a substrate it will deposit on the substrate so this is another technique so it depends uh, depending on your material you choose your technique so that's it uh, uh, participants have written a lot of messages to me for the excellent and the basic concepts of this uh, lecture Start, sir has started from the basic and bringing to up to the research level so participants have enjoyed the lecture and the one of the participants china has asked a very basic questions and uh, she is requesting to sir to enlighten how the different layers of molecules are formed how the different layers of molecules are formed what are the techniques okay. available okay so there are again is there are several uh, uh, techniques based on your material you have to choose your technique for example in organic material using elliptic technique you can do it once you transfer one layer on your substrate then again you deposit it through it like you see uh, you are uh, uh, heated milk cream floating you dip the spoon take out one layer is formed then you dry it then it will stick to the surface then again you dip again take out another layer it's very simple process but of course in molecular level you have to control lot of parameters so this is one process in vacuum deposition also vacuum deposition what you can do you have to control the temperature while melting your material you have to control the temperature and also time by controlling these two issues you can uh, control the thickness on the substance so it depends on what kind of material you are working and what techniques you are uh, working each technique uh, has advantage and disadvantage so we will take last questions this last question yes, comes from Mikhil Prasar he is uh, he is saying that thank you sir for a wonderful talk but he wants to know how do particle sensors differ from film sensors? How do particle yes. sensors differ from film sensors? Yes, uh, actually, the pro uh, properties actually in nano dimension mainly or molecular level, the properties of material change based on the organizations. And whatever I talked throughout the topic is mainly playing with the organization. So if you play with the organization, then based on the, the uh, organization of your organic material, optical behavior as well as electrical behavior changes. So, so uh, uh, for example, if you are preparing one, say, optical sensor. So if, uh, if you are working with particle, particle may be in solution or maybe fields, there may not, uh, uh, in my case, say, in some cases I used fret technique for designing sensors and i observed that in some ca cases in solutions or in particle form no fret occur but when i trans organize this molecule into thin films in presence of clay uh, i saw energy transfer occurs then i expose the system for, uh, uh, in presence of sensing material so based on this change i uh, we calibrate and uh, we design the sensor so actually in particle and in films the properties changes 
so in sensor actually sensor is nothing but you have a material with some kind of property you put or expose it in 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 presence of sensing material there will be some change based on this change you will have idea about your presence material so in particle and films you can control the property that's that's all so if you control the property so you have to optimize in which conditions in particle or film or solutions you have your desired property in a better way so that when you expose it into the sensing material you can have idea based on the change so that's it so it depends there are actually sir there are a lot of questions from the participants but because of limited time we could not pick up the questions i hope uh, dr arshad sir will has to be invited physically to the department otherwise we could not pick up the so many questions are there floating so i would like to thank dr hussain for this wonderful basics and resource level uh, lectures hope uh, dr hussain will receive our invitation in future also and very soon we will be meeting once again i thank you dr hussain for your kind wonderful lecture sir thank you sir thank you ashad thank you thank, thank you ashad this is atri yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i see i see thank you madam thank you and now over to uh, gulabsa for the third lecture professor shangam from uh, germany so over to gulabsa Welcome, Professor Chatterjee. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, definitely. Hi. Yeah, uh, hi. So, Gulabsha, you um, can. Uh, your expert is here, so you can please start. Let's see how do I start. Hello, this sir. Yeah, just let him uh, uh, start the presentation first. Okay, ma'am. Uh, should I proceed with uh, introduction? uh you can or you may wait for a second let him uh, uh, okay okay ma'am sure so the screen should be there mm, yeah, yeah it's coming it's here it's Wonderful. here yeah uh, gulabsa over to you okay um gulabsa Do you hear me? Yeah, wonderful. Gulabsa. Gulabsa, please start. Gulabsa. Okay. Um. Our uh, thunder faces. To introduce Professor Chatterjee, <laughs> hold the chair for optics and spectroscopy at Justus Liebig University in Giessen, Germany. His research interests include fundamental interactions of quasi particle excitations in condensed matter systems his experimental assets include includes correlating and controlling absorption and emission dynamics across several characteristic energy ranges to identify the relevant yeah. physical yeah. mechanism yeah. Scopy laboratories enable ultrafast thermal and plasma enhanced atomic layer deposition, ion beam, as well as conventional and pulsed RF spotter deposition. These results in applied research activities related to materials design for harsh environments and consequently technology development of the related growth facilities. His activities are funded by the German Science Foundation, including his current Heisenberg oh. professorship, and by the European Regional Development Fund. Women's okay. materials habilitation in experimental physics at Philips University at Marburg, Germany, 2009, where he successively became leader of the optics and laser spectroscopy group. He co-authored of more than 100 publications, age 29, in international journals, and holds several patents. So now I hand over the platform to you, please. Okay. Um, 
Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, I actually didn't understand everything, which is probably a bandwidth issue of our university. I hope you can hear me. If you don't, write something in the chat. And the other thing which is very important, would you please, if you have some questions during the talk, if I go too fast, feel free to write them in the chat. I try to follow it and try to actually answer them. And with this, I'm actually going to start my presentation now. Um, the title is Exoton Dynamics in Crystalline Molecular Solids and at their internal interfaces. And that actually sort of continues on the last answer Ashad gave regarding his work. What I'm trying to convince you in the next 45, 50 minutes or so is I can put on my camera for a while if it works. Um, if there are some bandwidth issues, let me know. Um, hello. The crystal structure and the molecular orientation actually do determine the kinetics and molecular semiconductors and at the heterostructures. And this is basically the last message that Ashad gave in his talk and answering a question. And that's a challenge we are actually systematically investigating looking at the structural property relationship in such systems. Um, before I actually start with the work and introducing what we do a little bit from my side, let me thank the people who actually did the work. There's my grad students, uh, Kolja Kolata, Robin Döring, André Rinn, and Meli Fai, who were actually instrumental in taking the work which I will present today. There's a bunch of other people working in my group who actually support them and interact and it's a very collegial group of I don't know 30 people currently who are working here. Um, nothing of this would have been possible without very well ordered, very well and structurally well defined samples which for these studies were pro provided by my colleague Gregor Witte from the Marburg University you heard in the kind introduction that I spent some time there, actually probably far too long, 13 years, 12, 12 13, 14, 15 years, uh, working there. And he's actually a molecular deposition person who stru provides structurally very well characterized samples. We had some experimental collaborations with Wolfram Heimbrod and Michael Österreich along the way to make sure that what we did was actually right. And I feel that uh, a good theory collaboration is always very helpful and we are lucky to have been publishing with three of our uh, theory colleagues. There's Robert Berger from Marburg. It's always nice to have somebody next door to talk to. Um, and we had a uh, rather successful collaboration with Leo Kronick and Jeff Neaton and the exchange on these subjects that we have here. Let me first answer the question, where is Gießen? It's pretty much in the heart of Europe. That's where I'm sitting right now. I'm watching a sunset. It's four and a half hours earlier here, a sunrise. So a good morning from me and a good day to you. I hope not to keep you from lunch and bore you during that uh, time. I hope to give you some informative physics. It's a long way and it's a pleasure for me to help you celebrate your 25th anniversary of the physics department and I'm glad to talk to you and thank the organizers for the very kind invitation. Um, you're sitting here in the heart of Germany. Here you see our building. This is actually one of the sunrises earlier in spring this year. Um, and you heard a lot about the Institute. We're actually a divided institute with two competencies. We have the solid state side and the nice thing about the solid state side is we cover the whole cycle from materials growth. We have a clean room where we have medium lithography. Um, we study fundamental properties using spectroscopy. That's basically my main expertise and doing also device physics by translating that to applied devices. It's just mainly optoelectronics, lasers, solar cells, 
these kinds of things. And we have a space physics side because as you see in the back, we have huge vacuum facilities. This is like 30 cubic meters of vacuum and we're building a second tank, which is as large, where we test ion thrusters. And here the optics expertise is rather handy because if you do experiments in such a big vacuum tank, tank you can do this using optical techniques because you can work through a window. Um, so the thrusters, re-entry processes, and the technology transfer between the solid state side and the space physics side is very important and we're very much profiting from that. And things like electromagnetic compatibility, long-lived performance things. I mean, if you shoot things into space, you want them to work because it's sort of difficult to go and service them. And that actually means understanding things at a very, very fundamental level to get huge reliability. Um, so the solid state side basically covers everything from materials to device. We have our own deposition techniques, which we actually do develop. Um, we have the processing and on the right hand side, the spectroscopy is my expertise. And I hope to convince you that investigating very, very fundamental many body effects inside condensed matter is actually useful because it helps you to understand applications. And I'm trying to motivate what we do and why we do it. From a very experimental point of view, we have two types of questions which we answer. There are certain fundamental questions like the structural property relationship I'll talk about today, which are basically quests which require question-driven samples. So you come up with an idea, with a concept, and you develop a model system which is most suitable for the things you want to study. And of course, there are sample-driven questions. There are people who actually fabricate very, very nice samples, and they see curious effects. You can call that sensing if you want. And they want to understand why these effects happen. Looking for the microscopic mechanism is also something we can do with the tools we have at hand. We have chosen, or I have chosen, to basically do spectroscopy, which basically means I do something energy resolved, and I chose photons as a sensor. Um, and that way we can address quite a lot of energy scales. We basically start in the far infrared or the terahertz regime where you're very sensitive to color, to correlations in samples, to higher order effects, to phonon scatterings, to all the infrared responses you're aware of. Um, up to the visible and the near UV, we tend not to go into the vacuum EV, so we stand, end up at 190 nanometers, six or seven electron volts. Currently, um, we will go beyond that as it becomes necessary, in particular, if you think about space applications. There is gamma radiation out there in space, and the higher you are, um, the more you actually notice that con cosmic rays impact you, and these things are relevant for electronics. And as our particular speciality, we not only use energy resolution, we also use time resolution. And the same way that energy resolution or addressing certain energies in a spectroscopic fashion um, enables you to address certain energy regimes, time or phenomena, time allows you to address different phenomena on different time scales. And this is something I want to illustrate in the following, but before I do that, let's do some PowerPoint spectroscopy. So we use optical techniques. Some of those you have seen or heard. There's the second harmonic generation or the sum frequency generation. In here, Ashad touched upon at the very end as a nonlinear optical techniques from which you can learn something about symmetries. But symmetries is something you can learn a lot of if you do all of these techniques polarization resolve. So even a very, very simple linear probe in reflection or transmission, which is basically what chemists call UV vis, or I tend to call linear absorption spectroscopy, can give you information on the structure of the samples and orientations of dipoles if you think about the polarization of light you're using. 
Then time comes into play when you start to pulse the radiation, and we can do this all the way down to 30 femtoseconds or so if you try hard, a little shorter. Um, then we can also excite the samples using a pump, and the pump is typically also very short. So you get an impulse response, and you can measure the reflectance of the pump, you can measure the transmittance of the pump or a probe beam. You can also measure the nonlinearities, like Ashad mentioned, and we can also measure spontaneous emission or photoluminescence, which has different directional properties from the coherent effects. And these things we try to access by optical means. So if you look into the lab, you see some photos on the left side. We tend to build our own instruments. And there's basically three conceptual things we're doing. If you want to know something about the density of states that is optically addressable, we do absorption type experiments. And for optically accessible or non-dipole forbidden or dipole allowed states, to put it positively, you use linear absorption. If you have something which is dipole forbidden, you can do more advanced techniques. You can do non-linear absorption type experiments like two photon absorption experiments where you could, in principle, identify dark states. If you want to know something about the population of a system, a straightforward way might be to look at emission. So if a state is populated and there is a certain population present and the system can radiate, you can actually see the emission of light. And for example, photoluminescence or electroluminescence are commonly considered as an indication of population. This is, strictly speaking, a little bit too oversimplified because you can also get emission through channels which are not directly populated. Um, you can think of systems as a filter. If you take a white light bulb, tungsten halogen bulb, you guys might still know that, it looks very white and light comes out in every color. And you put in front of that an optical filter, which is very narrow band and only lets through, let's say, the neon lines. You probably are aware, very familiar with the neon spectrum too. It's typically used for street lighting because it's supposedly rather energy efficient. It's this bright orange, well, it's not white, with this orangish color. And if you just look at the spectrum and don't know that there is a filter, you would think, okay, this is a neon light source. And this is something which actually applies to a lot of solid state samples. The samples have a complex dielectric structure and you have to be very careful what you see in emission because it's not necessarily what you think it is because you have no way of looking into that. So one has to be careful. And I already touched on the far infrared or terahertz spectroscopy where you're typically sensitive to correlation effects at very, very low energies. And of course, also to currents because if you go back to Maxwell's equations, you will find that motion of charges, aka a current, will radiate. If your current is fast enough, it will radiate in the far infrared or terahertz regime itself. So these things we look at. And these things we look at at very different timescales. And here I go back to Maxwell's equations again. Um, one colloquially says we excite electrons, but if we look in Maxwell's equations, we actually find there is no electron in there, even if we could include matter. But what is in there is a polarization. So what we have is we come in with an electromagnetic field and we excite a polarization. The polarization is something you can tailor expands that leads you to the linear susceptibility and the higher order susceptibilities. But it's still a polarization and you need some kind of scattering mechanism for an actual population to occur. So these scattering mechanisms can be very, very fast. So that fast that you actually don't notice them because they're faster than a cycle of light in times. But I hope to show you that in very well-ordered systems, these scattering mechanisms can be very, very slow. In particular, if phonon interaction can be tricked. And a lot of physics actually happen in this polarization regime before you get a population of sorts which can relax, which can cool, and actual correlations 
will develop. Now, this concept can be applied to molecular crystals and interfaces. I've stayed in the PowerPoint physics regime, and I hope to illustrate here what an exciton and what a charge transfer exciton is. The exciton will actually come a little bit later. A charge transfer is, of course, if you have two materials, which you can bring in contact, like a Duncan experiment, and you can excite one of the materials for simplicity, only the one on the left-hand side with the photon, and you excite carriers from the valence band to the conduction band, if you talk in solid states terms, or from the highest occupied molecular orbital, or HOMO to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO. And then the electrons up here find a, in a, in a state which is more favorable in energy, therefore they have to cross an interface if you have an exciton or a charge of sorts, and that can go into another material, so you have a charge transfer. And if there's a binding between this negatively charged entity and this positively charged entity, you can have a charge transfer state, and you can have a role of interface phone number, whatever up there. But actually, we figured that these things are nice, yet a little bit too complex for us. You have probably noticed that physicists tend to like to look at model systems, which are so modeled that you actually sometimes don't really know what they're talking about anymore. Um, so we decided, you know, let's first try to understand both sides of such a system and then look at the interface, and that will be the narrative of the following talk. So adapting the time scales we had before, what we expect here is we have an excitation which has a coherence which will form charge carriers. And these charge carriers will actually form excitons in this light blue lines, and we'll come to excitons again in a second. And having the interface around will change the carrier dynamics of the individual constituents considerably because the interface can open new relaxation channels, which are not there if you just look at one individual bulk part. And therefore, you see from light blue to dark blue, you get a change. And you see a charge transfer of state, for example, pop up. So I will talk about molecular materials, excitons, optics, and interfaces, and try to show you how we correlate the electronic excitations with model structures and show you that these optical properties are very, very highly anisotropic and the delocalization or the organization and the excitation dimensions actually play a very, very big role. And example, we studied the single exciton fission. That's a process I will also explain. It's basically a carrier multiplication and nonlinear response, which potentially is said to surpass the shockley quiser limit in photovoltaics. So you can get more current out than a conventional silicon solar cell. Um, not so optimistic that this will work in real life. However, it's a fun toy to play with. Hydrostructures will actually show these CT excitons and change the dynamics, and I hope to show you this. Molecular semiconductors are considered very, very versatile things. They're dyes. You've probably seen the blue dyes. They're very prominent in the Western world because all recycle bins for paper are typically uh, organically dyed using um, phthalocyanines. Um, they've been very prominent in flexible displays or flexible photovoltaics. Um, we decided to go a little bit further and not use disordered films, but use a crystalline solids to bring our expertise from solid state physics and look at the excitations in these systems and try to understand what they do and hopefully try to improve device performance. Now, I talked a little bit about excitons already. What is an exciton? An exciton is something like a hydrogen pair on a, di a hydrogen atom on a dielectric background, if you want to call it like that. And typically, people tend to know excitons from inorganic semiconductors, at least in the places I was 
at because you can basically discuss a lattice. You can go from real space where you discuss a lattice into momentum space where you have a band structure. And then you decide that the single particle picture of a band structure may not be sufficient. And you have to remember that you have electrons and holes or defect electrons, positive charges. These two are Coulomb charged entities and they can actually bind now, these binding energies are rather small in these systems. They're on the order of 10 milli electron volts. So reason is a large dielectric constant, typically, and the screening of the binding potential, which this results in. And these things are rather large compared to the crystalline lattice. So they're sort of delocalized specimens floating around in things like silicon or gallium arsenide. In molecular materials, the term exciton is commonly associated with the other extreme. That's a Frankel exciton. And if you go into the literature, you will find that this is an entity which is totally localized on one molecule and one molecule only. Um, lately, people are starting to notice over the last decade or so that the more order you introduce into a molecular material, the more important delocalization effects are. They're commonly termed charge transfer, although I actually don't like the concept because it implies the transfer of a whole charge. That's not necessarily the case. If you think in a quantum mechanical picture, you can have a wave function which is sort of floating around on several different entities, and you see results from a uh, calculation from Saha, um, from Jeff Neaton's group at that time, where she actually shows that, at least you see here, two molecules are excited that can also be several. But there are some cases where there's only one. Um, now, this concept of delocalization and interaction of molecules is actually fairly old. There is a a concept called the Davidoff splitting of excitons around, which is a picture introduced something like 50 plus years ago, that said, you know, if you have two molecular dipoles and they're coupled, you will get a splitting in the resonance. And this is basically a very simple picture of vector addition. You have two transition dipole moments. You can add them. If they're under an angle, you get a resulting dipole moment along let's say the horizontal direction as indicated here, or as long the vertical direction as indicated here. And if you have some insights into optical spectroscopy, you actually see that you can already adjust these using polarization resolved spectroscopies, because if the dipole moments are oriented, then you can adjust them by linear polarization orthogonal to each other. Um, and in a way, the Davidoff picture is a perturbation approach to a more delocalized, generalized picture. It basically says that exciton levels can split z-fold if z is the number of molecules per unit cell. For physicists, one and two are simple. Three and four become more, important, more difficult. And yes, they actually do. So we decided to look for molecules with two in the unit cell. And while looking for that, we stumbled across a very well-studied Drosophila system, which are the linear scenes. It's probably a boring molecule. This is pentacene, so you have five, six rings. And there's been work around there stating that if you have these systems, you will get single exciton free. You might know from your atomic physics class that in molecular systems or in solids, you can have singlet type transitions, which are optically allowed, typically, so they're dipole allowed. But due to exchange interaction, you can also have other spin configuration, where configurations where you don't only have a spin flip from down to up during the excitation, but you can also have a triplet excitation, which is dark, so it's dipole forbidden. And in these triplets, you can say if this is a bound entity, this can be something like two spin up or two spin down. This is two of the triplet states and a more intricate com linear combination of spin up and spin down states, which are three. 
which are energetically degenerate as long as you don't have a magnetic field. But they're at typically lower energies in systems which show strong correlation effects like molecular solids actually do. And you can think that if I have this scenario, I can actually excite one singlet state, and if the en energy level configuration allows, this one, one singlet can diffuse into two triplets, and thereby I effectively double the number of excited electrons by putting on only one photon, and that should lead to carrier multiplication and to energy harvesting beyond the shockley quiser limit for solar cells, which basically says, you know, if I have one photon, I can get out one electron, and the rest goes into heat. It cannot be harvested. You actually don't violate any of the uh, laws of thermodynamics here. You're still limited by the, by, um, so it's not possible to build perpetual mobile here. So you cannot generate energy, so everything is safe, but you still get more into currents. You can say that you don't end up 30% efficiency, but something like 60. Um, Actually, pentacene is very difficult, and let me touch upon this um, slide very early on, because the stacking pattern of pentacene crystals shown here on the left is challenging, because the differences between the molecules are all about the same. If you calculate the coupling molecules between the molecules, they're all the same, and we thought, you know, this is very nice that it shows this system, but it also exists in very many different polymorphs and it's challenging. So we thought, let's look for something similar, but more easy, and we ended up with the perfluorinated species, so we found somebody to rip away all the H's on the outside and add all the fluorine to that, and that changes the system dramatically for instance, you basically get a more simple crystal structure where when you calculate the binding, the coupling between the two molecules, you expect, expect a, law, a strong coupling along this direction where you get something like pi-pi stacking or slip stacking, whereas the hydrogen, or in this case fluorine, to carbon coupling in this herringbone pattern should be much weaker. And that's not the only thing. Um, of course, the electronegativity drastically changes if you remove fluorine and uh, add fluorine and remove hydrogen. The electronic pattern changes drastically. If you calculate the electron clouds in pentacene and perfluorinated pentacene or PFP, you see that the electrons tend to be at the center of the molecule, whereas in the perfluorinated species, mainly due to the large electronegativity, the electron cloud is on the outside. Um, it has a huge solvent shift and it has this different crystal structure. The vibrational pattern completely changes. The hydrogens are very light, they will vibrate. If you have the fluorinated specimen, fluorine is heavy. So in this case, the carbon backbone will actually change. This is the more subtle things that people commonly don't think about. We did the insanity check for singlet exciton fission. We came to the result that it actually works by the energetics because the singlet energy is more than double the expected triplet energy. And the nice thing is our favorite grower at that time could synthesize very well-ordered crystals on exploiting pseudo epitaxy, so or exploiting the um, organization on metal halogen salts, the crystal structure, you see your sodium fluoride and potassium chloride, you could grow the exact same crystal pattern, but in one case standing up, what we call that, and in the other case lying down. You see different color impressions in the microscopic picture. If you do the X-ray diffraction pattern, you actually see that the diffraction patterns are the same, but under different angles. Um, and if you do polarization resolve microscopy, you actually see that you get domain growth. Because this is pseudo epitaxy, the 
system can grow in two orthogonal polarizations to each other. You see, if you rotate your polarizer by 19 degrees, you get a red color impression and a blue color impression. If you rotate the polarizer by 90 degrees, these colors invert. And it's the same for the other samples. And here a picture is slipped in, which is not supposed to be there. This is a cut, copy, paste, and arrow. Um, this is resembled in the linear absorption spectroscopy, which you can do polarization resolved. This is basically quantifying the color impression that you get. You see your lowest exciton resonance is shifted by 27 milli electron volts in these highly ordered crystals at cryogenic temperatures. So this is all measured at 10 Kelvin. You can't see me anymore. You can't see the screen anymore. Let me shut down the camera. And turn that on. Is it back now? Thank you. Um, however that happened. Um, thank you for pointing this out. If I take too long, please open the microphone. I am faster in listening than reading. Um, so you see a shift of the energy lines in the absorption spectrum. And you actually see in the A direction of the crystal, there's basically no resonance in this energy regime. And this is just quantifying the color impressions you have here. And please excuse the wrong color we have here. OK. So we can do polarization results spectroscopy and access all crystal directions. And the linear absorption spectra for the three directions are shown here. And you see drastic changes in the A direction, where you have this head-to-tail arrangement, to the C direction and the B direction. And there's more subtle changes in the B and C direction, which are a direct consequence of the Davidoff splitting at the low energy resonances. And there's more pronounced changes at the higher energy resonances, which is probably a consequence of H and J aggregates that form here, or you project out of the coupled system, but I'm not going to touch upon that. So to study the system, we did pump and probe spectroscopy, which means we excite a laser and measure the transmission. Uh, we excite the system using a laser and measure the transmission. This is a differential technique, so we can actually measure the changes to the transmission only. This makes this virtually background free. And using polarization, we can do this on all crystalline axes on all samples. It's a rather complicated setup to give you an impression on the right-hand side. We have an amplified optical system. We can generate pulses of virtually every color. We generate a white light continuum, which is a directed white light with sub-100 femtosecond time resolution, we can measure the transmission to a sample, and then we do Bayes' law and study the changes. And there's certain changes that you can have here. I always like to call this slide Pump and Probe 101. If you think of a resonance, the resonance can do certain things. Again, the cut, copy, paste error. The resonance can shift. So in differential absorption, you will see this. This resonance can broaden which means it doesn't shift like I've shown here, but it gets broader. Um, if it gets broader, it means the area under the curve stays the same. The minimum, the maximum goes down, and the full width half max increases, which actually means that you get this type of a line shape shown at the bottom. And if you analyze this very carefully, the areas which are above the zero line here and the area below the zero line are the same. If you have loss of oscillator strength or loss of area, you get a bleaching. And this bleaching is a purely negative system. And you can also have a purely positive system, which is induced absorption. So if you excite a system, it can show more absorption than it did without. And of course, in real life, you don't have narrow resonances and you don't have the pure effects, but you have combinations of these. And let's see what happens in this crystal system that we have here. Um, 
Let me try and see if the camera will work again. Here, while the linear absorption spectra look difficult and different, the nonlinear absorption spectra look terribly different. You see induced absorption along the B-axis for low energies, which you don't see in the other spectrum. You see induced um, absorption, uh, induced, uh, you see bleaching at the exciton resonance, but it's different for the B and C direction. And along the A direction, something totally different is happening. You see a very, very strong induced in absorption resonance. And we think that we know what's going on in this system, and we think we have excimer formation and singlet exciton fission going on. A part which my grad student was terribly proud of was that he actually could find this little dip here in front after something like 700, 800 femtoseconds um, and convinced me that this was not an artifact, so there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in this graph. Because what he actually sees, you see a shift of the resonance early on. You see there's an energy change. Then you see something which looks like there's no population. And then you see bleaching of the states. And this he and we explained by the fact that we have a transition into a different parabola or the exomer regime, which basically depopulate states, but then the states are gone. And this certain transition regime you find on the order of several hundreds of femtoseconds. Let me come back to the A resonance. The A resonance is also very, very peculiar. What you see here is a phanotype resonance. Let me remind those of you who don't know what a phanotype resonance is. This is a phenomenon that you find an asymmetric line shape like you see here in red, which is the origin of an individual transition coupling to a continuum. And this continuum is a correlated triplet pair state. So it's something like a hydrogen molecule which coherently exists. Um, and this coherent state can be in the ground state or can be in the excited state only. And then it diffuses and you get a more Lorentzian line like you would see here at later times. And putting all of this together, we came up with a rate equation model, which we confirmed with EFT-based microscopic calculation, which let us understand the kinetics of the system where we have fast relaxation in the singlet state. We have an interplay with the triplets and the triplet stays, which triplet pair states, which are correlated entities which need to form and need to diffuse and that they can do before they actually form the incoherent triplet excitons can do either by an excimer state, which is a correlated singlet type state, or by a direct diffusion of the excitons and then give induced absorption signatures, which are predominantly along the B axis. And that basically means that Okay, if you have coupling between the molecules, process which requires coupling between the molecules is more efficient. Not too surprising, but a good message in the end. And from that, we basically turn to the hetero systems of pentacene and perfluorinated pentacene. Um, you see a schematic sketch here in these charge transfer states. It's typically not so easy to look at the oscillator strength, but look at the population. And therefore, we use time-resolved photoluminescence using a streak camera, which is probably the fastest camera that's around. The idea is it's basically like a cathode ray tube. It's a time to space conversion. Your photon excites an electron. Your electron gets streaked along your cathode ray tube, and you know by the point of detection which voltage the electron saw during its time of flight, and that way you can actually get very, very fast time resolution down to the picosecond level. We found out that there's actually several polymorphs of pentacene perfluorated pentacene heterostructures. One is a stacked heterostack where all the molecules stand. 
And then there's sort of something like a lying heterostruct stack while the PFP stacks very good as we saw before. The pentacene actually doesn't that well. And we can also have an intermixed structure where we have one pentacene next to one perfluorinated pentacene, one pentacene next to one perfluorinated pentacene. That's something very regular. And these three structures are basically illustrated at the bottom right. You see the layered structure, you see the standing structure, and you see the intermixed structure. And when you look at the emission spectra, you actually see that while the regular emission is at 1.5 to 1.8 EV, you see more pronounced emission at lower energies for the charge transfer structure, and it's most pronounced for the purple for the intermixed structure, which is also not too surprising. Um, this could be remnants of one of the resonances that you find here, which might be due to the fact that you have two big bulk systems sitting here, but it's only one of the two resonances you have. It's not both. So we, under, we tried to investigate this system by looking at the dynamics of all of these three characteristic resonances that we found, and they all have different lifetimes. The high energy resonances typically live very short, with a little exception, and the low energy or CT resonances live very long, and this is something you expect, because if you have a, an excitation which is spatially delocalized, the wave function overlap will be reduced, and this reduced wave function overlap will live longer than the unitary phases where these things can decay. We also have these little exceptions here which live longest, which are self-trapped excitons, which is basically a defect state in these systems. So, we thought, you know, how can these charge transfer excitons actually form? We have a donor acceptor pair, so one of the molecules, the pentacene, will act as a donor for electrons. The uh, fluoropentacene will act as an acceptor for electrons or as a donor for holes, if you want. And these two can, can contribute to the charge transfer state. And when you look at the energy levels and where you expect them from photoelectron spectroscopy, you actually find several things. And one of the things is none of the electron configurations that you expect will give you the charge transfer signatures we see in photoluminescence. Um, so something weird must be happening in the electron picture to get this exciton picture. And this is illustrated here. So if you find where the energy levels are, so the homoluma of the individual molecules where the singlet and triplet levels are in the crystals, you actually find that none of these things will give you anything close to the optical transitions we observe, which is sort of irritating, which means something else must be going on. And to understand this, we basically did photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy. What is photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy? Photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy, you look at the detection scan channel at very low energies, which is this gray highlighted area, and you scan your excitation light source across different energies. And this way, you actually quantify how much light you get out depending on what you excite. And for reference, I've shown the linear absorption of these um, molecules in, or molecular crystals or structures in, in gray. And on naive side, this charge transfer state or whatever that might be, actually only seems to be populated from the pentacene and not the perfluorinated pentacene. Too bad as we spent so much time studying the perfluorinated pentacene, um, but it doesn't seem to contribute. And with this mystery, we basically went to our theory colleagues and asked them, you know, does this mean in a very simple picture that you have here that we cannot have a whole transfer 
but only an electron transfer for these CTs to change. And if these things are blocked, the electron transfer cannot happen or this system doesn't behave well. And they said, you guys know this is actually wrong. What is happening here is a coupling effect between the molecules, in particular in the PFP. As we found out, this PFP actually couples. And when you do a calculation where you basically start with a dimeric picture, so you calculate one pentacene and one PFP, you get the energy, the orbitals at the interface. And then you expand your calculations by adding two pentacenes and two PFP. And you can find the energy positions of each of those. And then you can go one step further. You can add three molecules, you can add four molecules, you can five molecules, and then your computer starts to explode. But if you have five molecules on the left side and five molecules on the right-hand side, you actually start to notice that the pentacene molecules couple very weakly. There might be a little gradient uphill or a little gradient downhill, depending on the functionals you use. So in principle, this is a flat band situation on the one side. For charge transport, it becomes diffusive, and there is no internal potential gradients to foster this. In the PFP, on the other hand, we have coupling effects. And the interface to the pentacene leads to these coupling effects to have something like a band gap bowing. And it takes three to four molecules for the energy levels to actually reach the bulk state. And then it doesn't matter what happens on the side. But you actually get a bowing of the potential towards the interface. This is something which is not very surprising for inorganic semiconductor people because there is a band gap bowing at virtually every interface. That's the nature of the PN junction. And it also happens in these molecular systems because you have the coupling between the molecules. And that's why apparently the PFP doesn't seem to contribute to any of the CT state populations because the molecules you excite in the PFP, the excitation diffuse away from the interface into the bulk of the material. And that's why it seems that this is only populated from the pentacene side. But keep in mind, to get the state, to have the state present, you actually need the interface. So the orbitals do contribute. This is the difference between having states and having a population. The intermixed system should not have this because, of course, after the pentacene, you have the next perfluorinated pentacene, you have the next pentacene, you have the next perfluorinated species. So there's no way for the molecules to diffuse away. And indeed, if you do the photoluminescence excitation experiment in the intermixed system, which is shown on the very right, you actually see that all the peaks you see in absorption contribute to the emission at the lowest possible energy and these two are very, very simple. Because <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, now, I'm gonna lie. Like, I'm gonna lie. Guys, mic off. Okay, I'm gonna lie. 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 Okay, I'm gonna we have epitaxially grown films which enable these studies. We can get fundamental insights by doing very, 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 very sophisticated spectroscopy techniques, exploiting polarization control and high spatial resolution on these films. And that's when we can try to resolve these mechanisms that go on in ordered crystals. And with this, I'm very happy to answer any and all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now the session is open for discussion. I would like to request the participants to come forward with their question. If you have any query, please put forward. Everybody wants to go to lunch, which is sort of understandable. I request the participants, you have any questions, please interact with Professor Chatterjee. Professor Chatterjee is an eminent scientist, so it's very 
lucky for us to have with us and let us to take let us take the opportunity to ask questions and clarify your doubts any uh, sir i have a couple of messages through my mobile from the participants and uh, uh, and uh, one of the participants is uh, she is asking that in one of the slides it was mentioned that evidence of axiomatic states so she is in msc students and uh, she wants to know what is axiomatic states we will be okay. elaborately explain axiomatic states okay she is a msc student yeah yeah um so you know what a molecule is if you're an MSc student and you probably know that there's excited molecules and unexcited molecules and you might know no you should know sorry let, let me let me step out start start a little bit further back so if you think about an atom an atom is an entity which can exist in an unexcited state and can exist in an excited state um, and if two atoms bind you will call this a molecule. The typical, bi the typical example that people in physics discuss is hydrogen. Of course, you know the hydrogen atom very well. It's the Drosophila of atoms, which you study in atomic physics. But you know that hydrogen can exist as hydrogen two, the molecule, and it's energetically more favorable. And that's what you would call a molecule. An eczemer is a weird type of molecule which will only exist in the excited state. So typically for hydrogen you say the excited state is not bound. There's a negative binding energy so two excited hydrogen atoms will be fused. There are certain molecules which can only bind in their excited state and that's what you would call an eczema. If it's two different kinds of molecules, it's called an exiplex. So it's an, a bound entity of excited molecules. And the unexcited molecules actually don't exist. It's a very, very common phenomenon in dyes. It's the fundamental entity for eczema lasers. You might have heard that. It's something which emits very strong in the UV. And a lot of the lasers for eye surgery are these types of lasers or <coughs> laser deposition. These can be eczemas. Um, so it's basically a bound entity of two excited particles. And these particles are commonly molecules. Yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, she's saying that thank you so much for the excellent uh, explanation. She understood. Sure, there, uh, there are participants, Dipankar Edition, Ratnadeep. Amai Das, Hoxon, J.K. Maitit are thanking you for your nice uh, presentations and uh, very hardcore research work. So, sir, we are very lucky to have you in future. If there is an opportunity, we will have a physical seminar and we will invite you. Please do come, sir, to Silser. Silser is, uh, if I say very little bit, Silser is the very extreme part of Assam and it is the border of the Bangladesh. And uh, it can go uh, to Bangladesh border by three hours, and it is adjacent to the Myanmar also. Myanmar, you can go by seven to eight hours. So, sir, please do come to Assam, India, in future, and we will be very happy. And uh, I will be talking to us also if there is an opportunity. Sir, we like you physically to be here. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation and giving time this morning, sir. And uh, with this, I over to Kulapsa. Thank you so much. Can I, there was one more question in the chat, which yeah. I could uh, yeah. very briefly answer. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. There is a question. What is the contrast the between the molecular and ionic solids? Sir? Molecular and ionic solids. Now, Mole oh, yes, sir. a molecular solid is a solid, in my terms, a molecular solid is a solid where you would describe van der Waals forces as the dominant binding entity. So the binding is very, very weak commonly. I mean, in the end, it's all elect uh, Coulomb force. 
in a molecular solid, you would have a van der Waals force, whereas in an ionic solid, you would have a very much stronger Coulomb interaction and you would actually have di permanent dipole moments in your cations and anions that you have, whereas they, they are permanent. Whereas in a molecular solid, it's a van der Waals type, so you only have fluctuations or temporarily very short ionic contributions, which are on average zero, but still keep the matter together. So in an ionic solid, like rock salt or any, any salt, basically, sodium fluoride is probably the most prominent species. You have positively and neg negatively charged species, sodium plus, chlorine minus, whereas here, the actual molecules are in the unexcited state, charge neutral. So you might have a local redistribution, but it's still, if you look at the, think of the, the, the perfluorinated pentacene, the negative charge is distributed around and the positive is in the center, but still if you go far away enough, there's no permanent dipole moment. So I would call this a molecular solid. I hope this answers the question. And with this, I hope not to keep you much longer from lunch and I, Thank the organizers for inviting me and giving the opportunity to talk to you. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. And if I don't answer, drop me another email. Thank and you, sir. Over to Gloves. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So if there are no more questions, then we would like, we, uh, would like to say we have come to the uh, concluding, we have come to the end of this session. So if I have uh, permission from the convener. OK, so before concluding the session, I would like to request all of you to join us tomorrow at, at 10 AM for tomorrow's technical mm -hmm. session. Tomorrow, the login time is 9.30 to 10. 9.45, everybody are requested to log in. Yeah? Session will start from 10. O OK, sir. So mm -hmm. yeah, so try to uh, 